Well, everyone, welcome to another live stream here at Kirby Allison. And uh, there we go, we're back. Um, so, hey, this is our last week of live streams. Thank you to all of you for joining us. I couldn't be more excited about the guests that we have lined up for this week. A really fitting capstone uh, for what has been, I think, almost 60, if not more, uh, continuous live streams uh, that we have been filming kind of during this coronavirus uh, live uh, downturn and kind of the quarantine and everything. So uh, here we are, uh, kind of almost to the final stretch. Uh, next week, we'll be kind of switching back uh, to doing more in-studio filming to bring you all of our tutorials and kind of other educational videos that you guys have grown uh, to really expect and enjoy from us. Uh, but it's been really so refreshing and so nice to be able to kind of take a break from that uh, during uh, all these stay-at-home uh, kind of uh, requirements, uh, to reach out to some of our good friends from around the world uh, to talk about quality craftsmanship and tradition. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you for joining uh, us every day for these live streams. Uh, it's been so great uh, to, um, to sit here with all of you and talk about the things that we love. Um, few quick announcements before we get started. Um, first and foremost, of course, of course, we're still shipping. Our warehouse is rocking and rolling. We've got our new KirbyAllison.com website. Uh, so we've really kind of used this time uh, to really, uh, you know, to prepare, I guess, for the next uh, uh, several years that lie ahead of us. So uh, there we go. A uh, few announcements. First, uh, we're relaunching our TLB GMTO. We'll have some pictures we'll pull up later. Uh, but that first uh, GMTO we did with the black Capto Oxfords, uh, really was so popular uh, that we've decided to relaunch it. So we'll be sending that email out uh, later today, uh, and those listings uh, will be live on the website. These are some of the ones that we have in stock, some of our overstock ones here. Uh, but really great shoes, very well priced. And for someone that's looking to take that first step into fine footwear, uh, the TLBs that they're making for us uh, really is a great option. So I've got that. Uh, second, I just want to pull up this week's schedule uh, so that we can uh, let you know who all we have. Of course, everyone knows what we're expecting today, and I don't want to get too far in the way of that. Uh, but tomorrow uh, we have, um, where is the schedule? Can you pull the, uh, Christian doesn't have a schedule up. So let One me second. I think that tomorrow, uh, if I remember correctly, I don't want to get this wrong, so I'm going to just check real quick. Uh, I should have, we should have been better prepared for this. We'll pull this up in a second. But we've got, uh, tomorrow is Bonhams. We've got the global head of watches from Bonhams joining us. Thursday, we have um, uh, basically Floris Perfumery. Uh, there we go. Edward uh, Bodem from uh, Floris. He's actually uh, their head perfu perfumer, uh, but he's also the managing family member for a company that's been held uh, in the family uh, for really an exceptionally long time. Uh, and then Friday, uh, we're ending with a good friend of mine, Stu Bloom from Ray Fabricare, exceptional guy. Uh, he's actually going to be uh, joining us from his dry cleaners, and we're going to talk to him about uh, all the magic uh, that he does. Uh, so that's our schedule this week. Uh, we didn't have a kind of a Q&A uh, yesterday just because I was finishing up a long weekend with the family. Uh, so I think that we'll just we'll do that next Monday just to kind of finish off and really polish off this live stream uh, schedule. Of course, today I'm wearing a beautiful kind of yellow sovereign grade necktie available uh, on KirbyAllison.com. Uh, and there we go. But I don't want to speak too much because I know we've all come uh, to see one of my favorite gentlemen uh, from around the world, a friend that honestly I have to say I miss a little bit because I was supposed to have been in London twice uh, during this coronavirus. And as I look to the rest of the year, honestly, I can't say whether or not I'm even certain I'll be able to make it to London in 2020. Uh, but, you know, by virtue of the technology we have, uh, we're able to have Edward join us anyway. So Eddie Sahakian, you know, our uh, kind of our, our tobacconist extraordinaire uh, from London. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again. And congratulations to you and your father uh, for just celebrating the 40th anniversary of Davidoff of London. I think just as much of a tourist attraction, in my opinion, uh, as the Churchill War Rooms. I mean, there's never a trip to London that doesn't involve stopping by your shop. It's one of the things I really look forward to uh, most dearly. And, you know, the ability to, to see you and your father there, who are really one of you is pretty much always in the shop, and uh, to purchase and enjoy the fine cigars that you guys sell. So, Eddie, how are you guys hanging in there? Thank you so much, Kirby. Hello to to your good selves and to all your viewers, we're, we're on top form, I think. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We've had extraordinarily clement weather here in, uh, in London. Uh, we're getting ready to reopen the shop on Monday the 15th in a, in a cautious but careful fashion. 
Uh, as you very kindly pointed out, it was our 40th anniversary on the 29th of May uh, of the opening of the Davidoff of London shop. And although we couldn't celebrate it the way we would have liked to have done with real hugs and kisses and everyone around us, uh, we still did manage to release a, uh, a rather special cigar to celebrate the moment. Uh, and of course, uh, we had a plenty of smoking between Dad and I. Uh, I think we've had to defer the celebrations until you're next in London, uh, Kirby. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, I did see the, the YouTube, what is it? It wasn't the YouTube, it was the Instagram live video that you and your That's father right. filmed. I think, you know, you were able to interview him. You did a really just an absolute splendid job, and I enjoyed so much watching that. And so I think that that's actually pinned on your Instagram under the IGTV. You might have to be logged in, uh, you know, to your phone to see oh, that. Oh, thank you. That's um, right. But anyone that hasn't seen that interview, I mean, it's, um, I mean, your father's just got such an incredible story uh, in history. To hear him talk through that, uh, you know, really is something quite remarkable. And I know what we're doing today uh, really kind of, in a lot of ways, uh, kind of is woven into that history that your father has, which is... Um, you know, his love for Cuban cigars, but uh, his uh, incredible humidor full of just some of the greatest cigars to really have come out of Cuba that he's been aging. No, uh, exactly right, Kirby. We're, you know, our good fortune, our customers' good fortune, my personal and hopefully my son's good fortune is built on on the squirreling and hoarding of, of all cigars. I mean, my, my, my father... Uh, has a particular fondness for a certain size of cigar, but he is known to enjoy them all. So over the years, he's put them away, the ones he considered to be good options for aging. And um, uh, of course, as he very happily says, when I pull one out of one of his lockers and say, Dad, look what I found. Of course, he always says, we never lost it. I, I just hid it. <laughs> yeah. So that's all very, very fortunate due to him. Yeah. Well, um, I couldn't be more excited about what we have ahead of us, and I know that we've got a relatively long smoke, so uh, maybe we just kind of get started with this first. I know that we've got so oh. much to talk about. There's so many questions I want to ask uh, about kind of Davidoff's really a famous and legendary stock of vintage Cuban cigars, uh, but also about how you age the cigars and just about some of the stories behind these incredible sticks. Uh, and so without further ado, I mean, I've got this really absolutely incredible tube that you very graciously sent uh, with the Cuban Davidoff number one from 1990. And I have to say, I mean, there's bucket list cigars, right? I mean, you know, some of the cigars that, you know, I've smoked uh, kind of at your shop, uh, but this really, I think, falls into the category of a once in a lifetimers, uh, at least for me, or maybe first in a lifetime, hopefully not a once in a lifetime, but um, I mean, a 1990 Cuban Davidoff number one, I mean, this is really exceptional. No, well, I couldn't think of anyone better to share it with. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and not just me, but everyone else that's watching. I think we're up to almost 200 people, and hopefully they've got some cigars they're smoking too. But talk to us a little bit about this format. I know that this is, you know, a really famous, I mean, the Cuban Davidoff number one. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is an iconic cigar. That's right. Exactly right. Um, I think many people would, would argue that it is the very beginning, the very genesis of not just the Davidoff uh, cigars from Cuba, but of course, uh, even the Cohiba history. Because the size, it's called the Legito Number no. 1. And that's the nomenclature that's used in, in the Cuban industry. And that refers to the, to the length and the ring gauge. It's a 38 ring gauge. It's just around seven inches in length. Uh, it was purported to be Castro's, the cigar that Castro fell in love with, which eventually became the Cohiba Lancero. Uh, but before the Cohiba Lancero was released, there was the Davidoff number no. one. And it was produced in exactly the same facility, the El Ligito factory. And uh, the blend is for us on the light to medium side originally. Uh, with this sort of age, of course, it will have moved towards light and, and the flavor profile will have changed with, with almost 30 years of time on it. Uh, but it's still an exquisite cigar, elegant, beautifully made. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it as much as I'll enjoy smoking it with you. Well, I mean, it's uh, really the first time I've ever smoked anything with this much age, let alone 
uh, kind of a Cuban Davidoff. And so, you know, what should I expect? I mean, are there any special kind of precautions that one should take uh, in kind of handling a cigar of this age or in cutting it or lighting it um, that I should know before? I mean, I haven't even cut this, so I'll do this uh, kind of along with you uh, on camera. Yeah, sure. Um, well, as long as they've been well maintained, and, and, and we always do keep the cigars as best as we can, meaning the conditions, the humidity and temperature are important. We've done that part of the process. So now that it's in your hands, uh, the only precautions to take are similar to the precautions you would take with any good cigar. So use a sharp cutter. With this sort of ring gauge cigar, you can either use a punch cut or a straight guillotine, I would suggest, which is what I'll be doing. And um, before you light it, after you've cut it, just have an initial, what we call a pre-draw. Just draw through the cigar and taste. It's 30 years of age there. There is something still there. Uh, what we call the, the, the very fabled third fermentation or the, the micro fermentation that will have continued but almost ended in a cigar of this age. There's still something there to say. So, so you're going to taste it before you light it and after you've cut it. And then, of course, we will begin uh, the fun part, which is putting a flame yeah. to it. Yeah, well, great. Well, I've got um, my favorite El Casco cigar cutter here. I need to get you some of these, uh, Eddie, for the shop. And this is oh, my favorite. Thank this you. is my favorite cutter. And so here we are. Oh, that's you know, very cool. This is my trusty cutter. So let's. There we go. Perfect. Look at that. Perfect cut. Uh, this is the only cigar cutter that I've, I've been able to get a perfect, even cut. Uh, every single time. Uh, it looks wonderful. Is that is that with one blade or, or is that a three you blade? You know, it's a, it's a single blade, but because it's lever action, I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Anyway, we've got these on the website, just if anyone's wondering. <laughs> so let's see, pre-draw. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, I can, what are you tasting? I mean, help describe this. I don't know, I even know if I have the language, to be honest. So it's, you know, it's vegetal. I mean, the, the, the best way I would describe it, it's, it's vegetal. You're, you're tasting um, you know, the ghost of the fermentation. So ultimately, the tobacco will, will continue to chemically, at least, evolve and change over time. And, and you're getting just a, a very hint of that. It comes through mm -hmm. on the palate. Uh, it will change dramatically when we light it, of course. But there will be a clue. This will this leads you into that, and of course, it's always good to know what the draw is like before you've lit the cigar. Yeah. Um, God forbid, well, it's got a nice blood. draw. I hope you've yeah. no. that's. I'm relieved to hear that because with these ring gauges, they can be tight sometimes. Yeah, and just I mean, here's a photograph of the wrapper that we took earlier, and I just love. I mean, I imagine when this wrapper was new, would it have been white or would it have been cream like it's showing now? Well, it's it's essentially the same color. It may have lightened very, very slightly. But what's remarkable is, is the, the delicate, um, fragile nature of the, to, uh, of the wrapper. It's still in beautiful condition. It hasn't mm -hmm. cracked. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't become parchment-like. It's, it's got a certain youthfulness to it still, even after 30 years. And, and that's testament, as, or I'd like to say for us, but it's also how the cigar began. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we'll get in. I, I mean, I really would love to hear about kind of the aging, but let's light this and allow this cigar to develop kind of while we're talking. Uh, the wrapper, not the wrapper, sorry, but the ring also uh, is uh, a beautiful kind of cream color. Uh, would that have been the original color also, or would that have kind of changed over time as the tobacco has affected uh, the ring? That's a good question. It's become slightly yellower, and um, with with the this sort of age of cigar, uh, the wrapper on Davidoff's will always go slightly yellow. Uh, mm -hmm. Dare I call it, uh, what's the right expression? Of, maybe a sort of ivory almost. Yeah, it's a beautiful um, ivory or cream. I mean, it's more of an ivory right. than a cream, to be honest. Um, yes. And, I, and again, Do you notice the embossing? Yes. Mm -hmm. on, on the edging, as you go around, just past the, the gold dots, Oh there's yeah, a, there's an embossing. I didn't notice that. What is it like? Almost a fleur de lis or something. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 a very it's a very subtle pattern, but but it just uh, again testament to the quality that went into every element of the cigar. Yeah, that's beautiful. Wow. 
Well, you know, I'll tell you a funny story, Kirby. When when we opened the shop in 1980, my father's kept the original price list, and these cigars were three pounds and seventy five pence for one cigar. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, a little bit of inflation since then, wouldn't you say? I um, think so. <laughs> I wonder how much of that was taxed, you know, back in 1980 versus, uh, I mean, how much of it's taxed now? I mean, I can't even imagine. It's horrendous. It doesn't bear thinking. <laughs> yeah, let's not, yeah, let's not dwell. <laughs> well, here we go. I've got my new, uh, I think you inspired me to really upgrade uh, my lighter game. This is a... Uh, Kind of a vintage wow. a Dunhill table lighter that I have. I was very embarrassingly riding or lighting some of my cigars with a Bic, and I was like, you know, because my matches ran out, but this is what I've got now. So talk to me. So how should I light this? I mean, what is your preferred well, method? You've got a perfect instrument for that. I'm going to be using matches, but what you have, light the flame and bring the cigar just above the tip of the yellow flame. Mm -hmm. and rotate it gently so you get an even burn across and you can blow on it just to see. I'll, I'll illustrate by, by starting mine if I may. Yeah, please. There. So if that's of any help, you want to stay just at the top of the flame, the hot, hottest part of the flame. And if I had a lighter, it would look much simpler. The matches are always somewhat of a challenge. So here we're just kind of heating the tobacco. Actually, it actually kind of lit up quite, quite quickly, to be honest. Yes, and it, and it should. And if you want to check how well it's lit, just blow on it yeah. and see if the flame is, if the red is across the full front of the cigar. And you're rotating the cigar. Am I doing this? Can you see me? Does this look yes, proper? Yes, you're doing, you're doing that perfectly, Kirby. I always love the ritual that kind of you and your father have developed with lighting a cigar. It really is, it's almost like seeing wine decanted uh, at a nice restaurant. Well, thank you very much, Kirby. For us, and I think for all cigar smokers, the the ritual is such an important part of it. Mm. There we go. I think we've got a clean. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So uh, this is uh, the moment of truth here. Mm. It's, it's everything I remember. And you know, bear in mind, this tobacco would have started its life in probably 1987, 1988. Uh, and by the time it would have been boxed up in 1990, uh, it would have been through quite a lot already. Mm, uh, this is amazing. I must say, I mean, it's, um, I mean, a lot of cigars oftentimes are, can be kind of harsh in that first few draws, right? And kind of really need to warm up and mellow out. But this, you know, really has just such a beautiful kind of smooth start. Again, it really re reminds me of some uh, really well-aged wine that is just totally mellow and soft on the palate. Yes, that's a very good comparison. Uh, I often uh, draw that parallel when we have customers who don't know cigars but know wine. Yeah, exactly what you've said, you know, the idea of aging wine to reach its perfection, the same applies with, with a cigar. Um, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, um, Kirby, but the spice and the pepper that you would find in a younger cigar, uh, you won't find it on a, on a vintage of this, of this uh, age, let's say. Uh, and that's thanks to Mother Nature, the fermentation that has progressed. Uh, mm. And you will also not get the nicotine. Really? Which is uh, sometimes a bonus for us because it can so affect have you. To walk, huh? I'll have to work after this. <laughs> well, then you, you'll be able to work after this. <laughs> um, so you said that, that you said that this uh, smokes just like you remember it. When was the last time you you smoked the Cuban Davidoff Number One? I mean, I would imagine even for you, it's a special occasion cigar. 
It is. Um, I was very fortunate before the lockdown. One of my uh, one of my good customers um, visited and wanted to sample one of these, and I felt it would be rude if I didn't join him in the sampling. So uh, <laughs> we're talking about four or five months ago. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's uh, as it should be. I mean, yeah, you're definitely ruining me for the future. And you know, to smoke a cigar like this. Again, it would almost be a shame to do it alone or in private. It's really, I think, something to be shared with a good friend. And I couldn't be more honored, for one, to, to be given the opportunity to enjoy this, but then to be able to at least smoke it in your virtual company. Oh, thank you very much, Kirby. I, the, the same goes for me. And, you know, we have so few of these left. Uh, each one is cherished. Each one will live on in my memory. And... Um, and you're going to be a very important part of that. I'm going to not only remember this in my mind, but we're going to have the video to, to, to revisit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how many would you say, I mean, approximately, I mean, again, I mean, you know what, Davidoff hasn't been making cigars in Cuba since, what, 1992. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. what, 28 years ago. I mean, that's quite a long time to have been sitting on this stock. Um, I mean, how much, I mean, how rare are these? I mean, how many cigars, you know, do you even have? And I don't think I've ever seen these displayed in the humidor. Is it something that is really just by special request uh, from customers if they walk in and ask or inquire? Yes, uh, exactly that. Uh, we, we don't have enough to, uh, to make them widely available. And um, there is a constant, uh, rather enjoyable tension between my father, who is the ultimate collector for him these are his his children he doesn't like to part with them and of course the the excitement of a new cigar smoker or or indeed a, a long-standing customer who visits us who wants to buy one and enjoy one um, and i can see with my father i have a similar um sort of twin demons on my shoulders one of them says don't don't sell it because you can't replace it it's yeah. it's literally irreplaceable but on the other side, it's the feeling of joy to be able to share something we've loved and kept for so long with, with other cigar smokers. Uh, that, at the end of the day, is the ultimate pleasure of cigar smoking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, at the end of the day, uh, is indeed. And I think, again, just the story behind these cigars, I mean, thinking about how long ago it was uh, when, you know, these the tobacco was grown or that these were wrapped and the fact that, you know, that... Uh, that uh, Davidoff has been out of uh, Cuba for so long is uh, really quite marvelous. So, yes, yeah, very, cigars very much, are always yeah. a shared experience. Yes, and and you know, Kirby, I'm curious your thought on the on the the shape. The, the it's obviously a very thin cigar for for current modern fashion of smoking. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on on this sort of ring gauge? Yeah, well, you, I mean, I've certainly um. Let it be known that uh, you know some of the Lanceros are my favorite of all uh, the current formats, and I really find that the longer, thinner uh, ring gauges um, are so much more elegant than some of the really fat stuff we have these days. I find that uh, it's just the length is elegant, but if it was, you know, it's elegant, but if it was uh, too large of a ring gauge, it becomes kind of a little bit uh, clumsy. Uh, and then it just fits nicely in the hand. I mean, I really wish I saw more cigars like this today. Yes. You, you know, I was thinking about it, Kirby. A cigar, the most comfortable sizes for me are the ones that feel most like a pen. And if we extend that example, you wouldn't be comfortable writing with a very thick pen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that's why it just sits so easily in the hand. It's yeah. exactly like I mean, a beautiful pen. I've got some of my um, you know, beautiful Watermans right here. Uh, and if you were to look at these, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the size of this is really kind of about the same, you know? Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, this is really, I just, I, I'm enjoying this so much, I can't even think what to talk about. But um, this is just so <laughs> sublime. I mean, it really is so smooth. Um, so another question. So talk to me a little bit about kind of just the aging process for these cigars. 
because I know that it does require uh, you know really special care uh, in order to kind of prolong the aging process, but also to just protect them against tobacco beetles or I don't know yes. mold or anything else that could develop. Um, and it's a quite a valuable. I mean, this is a really valuable stock that you guys have down there that I'm sure you guys really take great care and really uh, overseeing. Yes. Uh, well, uh, those are very important considerations, and you know, quite early on uh, in in the opening of the shop in the early '80s, uh, it was not uncommon to, to to get the odd tobacco weevil arriving from Cuba as a sort of unwanted passenger in in the box. And tobacco weevils, uh, for those of our viewers who don't know, um, they lay tiny, tiny eggs on the tobacco. And you would not see those eggs if you were physically looking with your eyes. You only become aware of them when they hatch. And the little larva eats its way through the tobacco and then turns into a little beetle and flies off. Unfortunately, that means they can pretty much finish off a, a box of anything. And, and I've had the horror of seeing, you know, vacuum sealed boxes from the 80s, which we kept as evidence uh, of Dom Perignon cigars, 25 of them. The only thing left were the rings in perfect position in the box. Everything else was a fine black powder. Uh, that's what they can do. <laughs> so <laughs> to mitigate that risk, uh, temperature and controlled humidity are the most important elements. These little tobacco beetles will hatch usually above about 19, 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure exactly what that is in Fahrenheit, but I would speculate in the mid 70s. Yeah, and is. with humidity, ideally about 70, 72 relative humidity and higher, they'll begin to hatch. So what did we do initially? We brought temperature down and humidity slightly down. So in our big storage downstairs in, in our shop, we brought the temperature down to close to 12, 13 degrees centigrade and humidity down to about 65 relative humidity. And thank God, and we have much to thank the weevil for, because if we had not done that, we would not have stumbled upon a wonderful way to keep cigars for very long-term aging. Uh, essentially, by accident, we created the perfect environment for keeping cigars for multi-decade aging. Yeah. Uh, and that's, and so that's guess, really how it happened. Yeah, and I guess even comparing this to, uh, because you can still buy cigars like this in auction and you can find them, you know, maybe at some other cigar stores, but to your point, you know, if you don't know the provenance of the cigar and how it's been stored or aged, you know, just because this is smoking beautifully doesn't mean that, uh, you know, someone else's, you know, Davidoff number one from the same era would smoke as nicely as this does. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and Kirby, something we've been doing now for, God, at least 30 years, and I hope most of the Davidoffs we would have sold will have it, is we've used a variant of our Davidoff of London stamp. I'm not sure if you can see it on the bottom of the box yeah, there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's a green ink and uh, the phone number may have changed slightly in the format, but um, that allows us to immediately know if a box was originally sold by us. And that helps us because if ever someone comes back with a box, um, we know uh, it, it was originally kept by us. We know something about its history, but if it turns up and has no marking of where it was sold, when it was sold and in which market, it becomes much more difficult to have any confidence about the, the quality and, of course, hopefully the way we'll end up smoking. Absolutely lovely cigar. So um, let's talk about some of the other uh, kind of Cubans and kind of vintage cigars um, and age stock that you guys have. We've got some photographs that you sent us. We'll probably just go through these in the order that you sent us, uh, sure. starting with the picture number 37. But... You know, I'd love you. I'd love for you to kind of talk through some of these, and um, we might need to punch in a little bit on that one, uh, Christian, and with, just kind of let us with know. With pleasure, I, I, I can see it okay now. I, I'm sorry, I'm coming closer just to see it better on the screen, but I'll talk you through that. So, uh, top left is the most recent, and it's uh, the Cohiba 1966 from 2011. That's a limited edition 
uh, really beautiful and uh, it's already a classic. As you move next to it on the top shelf, you've got a really, really rare cigar there. That's La, uh, La Flor de Cano Diademas. And it was a Churchill sized cigar under the La Flor de Cano brand. It was produced for a very short period of time, pretty much the mid 80s through beginning of the 90s. And um, the green ink for the Flor de Cano is, is very distinctive. Uh, there's probably 10, you know, probably under 100 boxes of these left in the world. There might be a few more. Um, very rare, a beautiful blend and a Churchill size. Uh, when you drop down to the bottom shelf on, on my left, so beneath the Cohiba 1966, that's the Cohiba Lanceros. And what's unusual about that box, it's a 50 cab, uh, so, sorry, 50 dress box. Normally they come in 25s. Uh, and of course the band is one of the very early variants of the Cohiba band. So that would have been from, I believe, 1990, possibly 88. Um, a very rare cigar and, and quite delightful. And then the last one, that's again, it's a Cohiba, the, the bottom right. Uh, that's probably my favorite, almost, yeah, probably my favorite limited edition at the moment. And it's the Cohiba Double Corona from the 2003 limited edition production. Wow. Uh, insanely collectible now. You know, it went through a period where many people didn't value it as much as the Sublimes from 2004. But in recent years, it's it's become a spectacularly good smoke. Yeah, that's amazing. And these are all boxes that you uh, and your father would have purchased, you know, originally from Hunters and Francao, the distributor, and they have really been in your sole kind of custody um, and care all this time. Is that right? Mm hmm. That's exactly right. Um, you know, we're very careful. Because we can't guarantee provenance, if a cigar leaves our shop, then we just won't repurchase it. You know, we don't buy to resell um, because of the provenance question. Uh, there's a few cigars from our very, very old customers that have remained in the shop. And, you know, given different times, they've said, you know, we don't need them anymore. We've stopped smoking. Would you like to buy them back? And then we'd be very happy to do that. But everything else, we don't want to be able to uh put our hand on our heart and say we don't know where it's from we have to be able yeah. to speak about its problems yeah absolutely and i think that's what people expect when they come to davidoff of london of course uh, is kind of the guarantee of your family behind what it is they're purchasing and i even see that in kind of different regional markets where you know <clears throat> i feel like london in some ways and you'll have to let me know if this is perception is at all true you know first probably gets some of the best stock of cuban cigars but then, you know, just the way that they're kind of handled, you know, from, you know, whenever they leave Cuba to whenever they reach the distributor uh, to whenever they reach the shops is just at probably a higher level than what I see elsewhere. Well, thank you, Kirby. Um, you know, we, we, we like to think the same. Um, I know that there's other markets that get wonderful production from Cuba, um, but I think you nailed it. The, the way it's looked after the moment it arrives by Hunters and Francao. Uh, ultimately, hopefully, by all the cigar merchants who, who take them, and even dare I say, the customers who buy them, there is there is immense generational knowledge about keeping cigars, aging cigars, and I think um, the UK, possibly Switzerland, and dare I say, Italy and perhaps Hong Kong, you know, are amongst the few countries that have had, you know, multi multi generational histories of keeping, aging, and improving cigars yeah so back to this photograph we had um i mean this is a broken box uh, a lot of these really highly collectible kind of aged and vintage um cuban stock um <clears throat> do you generally hold the full boxes and you know like the the four that we see there i mean would you ever break a box like that or is something like that really exclusively sold as a complete box i mean once it reaches that level of collectability yeah, it's, a, it's very rare that we'll, we'll break the box, but uh, we're always looking for an excuse. So <laughs> uh, occasionally uh, an event comes along or, or some friends come along who, who really, you know, the cigar matches the moment. And at the end of the day, as precious as a box of cigars can be, 
they're never as precious as, as the friendships we have and the people who enjoy them. So sometimes the opportunity does present itself and we'll break the box and, and all of us hopefully enjoy it. Um, the other place where we do occasionally dip in uh, singly is our lounge in the Bulgari Hotel. Um, you know, we keep one of the cabinets there really for, for some of my father's rare and speciality vintage cigars uh, and make them available for single purchase because uh, not everyone can buy a box. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. And I've been to the Bulgari Hotel, you know, to smoke. Um, so it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant lounge that uh, you and your father have there. So just get, as a little bit of a rule of thumb, just to kind of help those of us that maybe don't know, I mean, you know, a box of rare cigars like that, I mean, what do they go for? I mean, what's kind of the general, I mean, what, what, mm. what order of magnitude are we talking about here on some of these? Well, um, let's, you know, coming back to, the, to, to that sort of set of four we were looking at, um, Something like the 1966 already, you know, when, when it first came out in uh, 2011, it would have retailed in the UK for somewhere in the probably, uh, I would say, three, four, maybe 500 pound region. Today, expect to pay two and a half thousand pounds plus for a box of 10. Yeah. Um, the Florida Cano Diademas, it's almost um, impossible to value that because of its rarity, but. Um, I would not be surprised to pay at least ten to fifteen thousand for a box that's of twenty-five. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that, that's the one on the, the top right. That's the one on the top right. Um, the Lanceros, the cabinet of fifty Lanceros, you see in the bottom left. Uh, assume, well, being aware that it's a it's a box of fifty, again, I would be looking at ten to twenty thousand, depending on its specific age. Uh, those ones that you see, they're, they're not cellophane wrapped. If you found that exact box, but the cigars were cellophane wrapped, add another 30-40% to the price. Really? Okay, I was going to ask about that also because I know that now a lot of the Davidoff cigars are cellophane, cellophane wrapped. And I don't know if I was speaking to you, but you were saying that at least with the new age stuff that it comes in a cellophane wrapper that you prefer to keep it in the wrapper. Um, does that add and even further kind of contribute to the, the aging? Yes, I mean, what, what we discovered, you know, many years after the, the, the original discussion was had is that a cigar, any cigar, but especially cigars are aging in cellophane, the cellophane creates a little time capsule and it mm -hmm. really limits the amount of oxygen that can interact with the cigar because ultimately oxygen uh, and of course the humidity um, that move around the cigar are the ingredients to the ongoing fermentation and call it the breakdown and recharacterization of the chemicals in the cigar. So if you can retard that as much as possible with temperature, lower humidity, um, vacuum sealing, or at least reducing as much as possible the oxygen, then you're going to make that cigar live and age much, much slower and live much, much longer. So if you're lucky to have a 30, 40-year-old box of cigars, which have been always kept in cellophane, there's a very good chance the smoking experience is going to be much more vibrant. There's going to be much more personality to the cigar uh, than would otherwise be the case. Yeah, that's great. I'm just... Uh have to take a picture of this to post on Instagram. I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me for being so rude right now. I was trying to do that during a break. Um, I don't blame you. I camera. do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something to let people know that this is happening right now. Um, so that's an interesting point. So if, if I were to smoke, um, let's just say this Davidoff number one, right, just for reference, this cigar, which um, I presume was not aged in the cellophane wrapper, with one from the same year that has been aged in the cellophane wrapper, I would taste the difference. Yes. Yes, you would absolutely taste the difference. In fact, we had exactly that experience uh, some years ago. This was, I think, in 2013, perhaps. Um, we were super lucky. I, we found a few boxes of our Davidoff number ones from Cuba. Uh, from 1988, I believe it was, which was still cellophane wrapped. And at the time, Simon Chase, bless his soul, who is no longer with us, um, he was a dear friend to us. And 
the ultimate knowledge on all things Cuban cigars. Um, he very kindly visited us and I showed him the cigars and he had been involved in the original discussions around whether cellophane should be applied to Cuban cigars or not in the late 80s. And his view was they shouldn't. So I said, Simon, look what we did. And I gave him one of the Cuban Davidoffs in cellophane and one without the cellophane from exactly the same year. And we smoked them. And the cellophane wrapped Davidoff, it was like going back in time. It was like we had just got the box maybe five, six years before and was wow. smoking it with that sort of age on it. Uh, he was shocked. I was shocked. So much so that we actually organized an event again in the Bulgari and we shared that experience with, with a group of friends, uh, about 20 of us. Amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Well, let's keep on going. I, I love kind of talking about some of these boxes. So let's, uh, Christian, go on to kind of some of the next photographs. And um, if, uh, Eddie, if you won't mind mm. kind of indulging us in what we're seeing. Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a, a cracking cigar. Um, I understand in Spain they refer to this cigar as the Monte Cristo A. They refer to it as a six bull cigar uh, because of its size. It's a nine inch cigar. It's a 49 ring gauge. Um, it's the Gran Corona size. Um, and the reason it was called the six bull cigar in a bullfight, you could see six bulls by the time you got through the cigar. <laughs> I that like kind that. Of cigar. Even, yeah, that's it. Um, and unfortunately it's a discontinued cigar from Cuban and that particular box in, in the dark varnished wood um, is from the mid nineties, I believe 1996. Um, they changed the color of the box in later years, um, so you will see some lighter colored ones, uh, which are more recent production. But even those would be probably 10, 15 years old. This one happens to be 24 years old now. Um, again, a beautiful cigar. Mm. Still smoking so smoothly. I mean, uh, I mean it's, it's interesting how this builds as you smoke but in, in such a delicate, elegant way. I mean, it's really, it's, uh, I mean, this cigar is, I guess, all in the subtlety. Yes, that's a really good point, Kirby. Uh, advice I always give my customers who buy this sort of age profile cigar is enjoy it as your first, if not your only, certainly your first cigar of the day. Uh, your palate should be entirely fresh and receptive, uh, and then you'll pick up on the nuance. If you smoke this as your second or third cigar of the day, you will deaden and mute so many of the subtle flavors. Yeah, and even not, I mean, someone was asking what I'm drinking with this, and I'm just having a little bit of sparkling water. Uh, you also mm. probably wouldn't want to have this with any type of spirit because, um, you know, it would almost overpower the palate. Yes, uh, I'm with you on that, uh, Kirby. I'm, I'm drinking plain water. And um, you could probably you could probably dip into a very light um, whiskey, perhaps something with great age, um, something with a hint of sweetness, perhaps. But I wouldn't do more than that. I would I would really give it as much space on the palate as as you possibly can. Yeah. So uh, let's keep on going here. So let's look at our next photograph. Just you really did send us some some really absolutely marvelous. I mean, look at that lineup. Right there. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> that's a dream. Well, that, that's uh, <laughs> amongst amongst uh, some of my favorite cigars, and that that uh, um, quintuplet, that lovely grouping of, of five different sizes from Davidoff, are what's called the Thousand series, and they were produced uh, subsequent and after the the original sizes were released by Davidoff. These came out probably in the mid seventies. And the sizes uh, are, are incredible because the, you know, starting on the left with the small number, the 1000, it's a thin gauge uh, short cigar, really a 25, 30 minute smoke. The 2000 exists already and currently in the Dominican version. So the size hasn't changed there. It's about a classic Corona size, maybe Petit Corona size. The one in the middle, the 3000 is, is a cigar that Davidoff discontinued even in the Dominican line some years ago. And I'm so, so sad about that. Um, both the Cubans and non-Cuban producers have all seemed to fall away from this slim Panatella size, which is 
a 33 ring gauge, so really thin yeah. and long. Um, and it's gorgeous. Weirdly enough, that size has aged so well. And if you're lucky enough to find a 3000 from that period to smoke, uh, you will be bowled over by the personality, the flavor, the character, and evolution as you smoke through it. Um, moving across the 4000 is a uh, typical Corona size. Getting onto a Lonsdale, it's a 42 ring gauge. And the last one, the 5000, um, is probably one of the rarest in, in the 1000 series. Uh, simply because of the ring gauge. It's a 46 ring gauge, and it doesn't sound like a lot in today's world, but at the time, it was one of the thickest, if not the thickest, Davidoff you could buy, except for the Dom Perignon, which was the Churchill mm. size. So um, if you want to get as close to a Robusto as possible, because Davidoff never produced a Robusto in Cuba, that's as close as you'll get. And it's, again, a beautiful cigar. Very, very rare. Uh, amazing. I mean, I, I just love the look of the cabinet. I mean, there's just something about, um, you know, what that looks like that uh, if I ever have the opportunity to purchase a cabinet, uh, I'd always prefer to try to do so. Uh, this is another, is this that, uh, talk to me about this, is this that first one that you showed in the top left of that group of four open boxes? Yes, exactly. It's, it's exactly that. Um, and uh, it's just the seal, the, the top of the box when it's closed. Um, one thing I wasn't 100% sure about, that's why I was looking more carefully at it, whether that is actually the short Robusto, sorry, the short Churchill from Florida Cano. And it's possible, I can't quite see enough of it to, to know, but it's possible that that is the short Churchill. And if it is, that's even rarer than the Florida Cano de Adamas. And it would be a cabinet box, so a sliding box rather than the, the hinged lid. Mm -hmm. And it was basically a robusta sized cigar. And uh, again, produced in a very limited period of time. Very, very few of these left. And back in 2000, and I, I'd like to think 11, but it might have been 13, um, in the UK market, we produced, or Hunters and Frankau produced, a uh, testimonial to that cigar called the Florida Cano Short Robusto. And it was a very, very uh, sweet story to that because uh, Simon Chase, of course, was around and he knew all the history of the blend and, and how it was made and the colors and the way the box should look. But when Cuba came around to manufacturing the cigar, they'd been told to use the green ink and to recreate the blend of that particular cigar. They didn't have either the cigar nor the recipe for the blend, nor the color of the green that was used on the original boxes. Yeah. Um, so Gemma Freeman asked around, and my father, of course, happened to have one, and he very kindly sent the box to Cuba so that they could find the right ink and also taste the cigar and get a handle on the, the blend that would have been used. Uh, so we feel very closely associated with that particular UK regional, the, the Florida Cano Short yeah. Robusto. Um, and of and course, Dad, it... uh, very happily, yeah. gave away a cigar in his box for that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you give and take, you give and take. And again, I mean, I think this goes back to the contribution that your father has made to just the, the cigar industry has really, uh, can't be overstated. Uh, I mean, you know, for one, he's a statesman and has, uh, you know, probably uh, really helped guide and uh, develop so many people's appreciation and connoisseurship of fine cigars. Uh, but that also kind of extends, you know, to him traveling to Cuba, you know, every year I know that he and you go uh, for the, uh, the Habanos Festival and actually collaborating with, you know, the Cubans as Davidoff uh, to really further develop these, uh, these brands and the cigars. No, th thank you very much. Uh... My, yeah, uh, it, comes, it comes with a love for the product. And uh, if anyone asked my father, I, I don't think it's limited to the Cubans, if, if anyone approached my father with any cigar question or any cigar-related project, I'm sure he would be <laughs> very happy and excited to be as helpful as he, as he always is. Yeah. So how does a brand like that, I mean, you know, the Jay Cano, I mean, it's incredibly collectible. But 
I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, they don't make anything under their current production. So is that label just kind of fallen off as uh, the Cubans have kind of consolidated into what their core portfolio of uh, brands are? Well, La Flor de Cano um, does, does continue to be made in Cuba, but in a very, very small way. And it's, it's one of their, what they call their regional brands. So okay. it's not given the international distribution of the big core brands like Cohiba, Monte Cristo, Altman, and so on. Um, and sometimes it comes, sometimes it goes. It gets used quite often in different regional productions, so limited editions made for, for specific regions. And that's where you'll find some really, really interesting uh, expressions of the Florida kind of brand, uh, not just in the UK market, but, but in other regionals as well. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Next up, we've got uh, some of um, some Dunhill. Is this what I'm looking at next? Is this an... That's an right. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a, a, a very dear box uh, for my you father. You can tell that, that we're getting to a, a slightly more recent... Uh, uh, vintage, given the fact that now we've got tobacco warnings. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a the, the the box age of that is 1986. Really? And it's the Havana Club, and the Havana Club is basically the same size as the Monte Cristo A we saw earlier, a big nine-inch cigar. And in this particular presentation, there were five individual cigars in individual slide lid coffins that mm. were sitting within that larger box. So when you open the lid, slide that lid open, you would find five individual wooden boxes containing these pretty big cigars. And why that's particularly dear for my father is um, this, I think it would have been the early 90s, he, he was in attendance at the uh, Alfred Dunhill shop in Duke Street. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, I think it was Richard Dunhill, who was part of the family that owned it at the time. Uh, he, was in, he was there and he knew my father. And I think for charity, they, they did a little raffle. And uh, my father bought a ticket for the raffle, and they went through all the prizes, humidors, this, that, whatever. And the prize my father actually won, which was selected, the number was selected by Richard Daniel himself, uh, was that box of cigars. Oh, wow. So with great mirth and merriment, he sort of said, Ah, oh, Edward, look, uh, you, you run David off, and you've won a box of Daniel cigars. So... My father being my father, he said, well, thank you. I'll only accept it if you sign it for me. <laughs> so on the back of the box, <laughs> we have Richard Dunhill's signature and the date, which, which makes it really special. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's, that's got to be uh, from the private humidor. I can't even imagine that would be something uh, that would part the family with a story like that. And, and, and I should say the Dunhill, the... the Cuban Dunhill cigars that are around today are as rare, if not rarer, than the, the Davidoff cigars from Cuba. The lower you know, the, volume, right? I mean, it's uh, oh, incredibly... I mean, exclusive. small volume, and they smoke really well. And in the collector's market, the prices you'll see on any Dunhill Cuban is, is probably amongst the highest prices you'll see on any cigar. I can only imagine how those age you know, being essentially double boxed in individually, kind of in their individual coffins. We'll, we'll need to find an occasion to, to investigate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let me know. I'll come watch. Um, so <laughs> <Yeah. and> <laughs> You'll need to smoke one of them. <laughs> um, so next we've got a really young, dashing guy, you know, with a big smile on his face in between uh, uh, two, <laughs> again, uh, you know, beautiful boxes of cigars. Um, the, the grin of a man that you know is uh, in good company there. Uh, what are we looking at? Mm -hmm. mm. So, those are the H. Upman Sir Winston cigars. And the reason they are particularly interesting, for, for a collector at least, is of course the age. They are um, typically from the early 90s. Could be late 80s, but I think it's the early 90s. And what distinguishes them is the color of the box. So they are a varnished dark green wood when, you, when the box is closed. You can probably catch yeah, it along the you rim. You can kind of see it on the rim, yes. I wouldn't have noticed it had you not pointed uh, that out. Well, shortly after, they, they transformed. The color became a dark brown uh, and then eventually a light brown. So the dark green Sir Winston boxes are the most collectible. 
um, and we were very fortunate to have a few in stock. So we've held tightly to those, and hence my big, big smile at that moment. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Gosh, I, I just love these stories of how, you know, a lot of these cigars, you know, have just kind of come in and out of production. And I mean, it's so much of a part of the history of just Cuba. Uh, and of course, you know what is their largest export, which is, um, you know, cigars, and uh, you know just how these things have just kind of ebbed and flowed, and they kind of experimented with different things, and um, you know that's, you know, has given rise to these incredibly interesting kind of, you know, not one-offs, but uh, smaller volume productions that, again, make collecting so fun as the pursuit of the obscure and difficult to find. Yes, very well put. Yeah, an incredible encyclopedic of knowledge. I mean, it's like, you know, we're just walking through these, and it's like, you know, the stories that you're able to just pull at your command uh, again are, you know, you're, you're never at a loss for uh, interesting things to discuss. Uh, that is for sure. <laughs> um, okay, up next, we've got some Partagas, if I'm reading that. Yep. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a... An amazing cigar. It's, it's, uh, most cigar smokers know it. It's the Partagas Series D number no. four, and it's the the, part, the robusto size in, in the Partagas range. The reason these are particularly interesting is their age. Um, you know, these would be I think it was probably mid to late nineties um, by the time they came out. Um, and the reason they're they're unusual and rare is uh, not many of them survive. The Robusto was smoked, and certainly in the, in the 90s when the, the cigar boom took off in the U.S. Uh, and the rest of the world, uh, the Robusto size in Partagas was one of the most consumed cigars. So very few were, were laid down to rest. Most were smoked and enjoyed. And a very interesting anecdote, which again came from Simon Chase to, to us. Um, you know, he was in the industry when you know, Robustas were entirely unfashionable. And the only two Robustos that were made by Cuba in the, in the 70s were the Partiga Series D number no. 4 and the Ramon Alonis Specially Selective. And he had a really interesting statistic from, I think it was from 74, 75, something around that period, uh, that the total production by Cuba of robusto sized cigars, so that one and the Ramon, was 4,000 sticks. Wow. Now, just to put that in context, that's probably the number that is produced by one factory in half a day in Cuba today. And that was the entire annual production of robusto sized cigars. Yeah, and I so guess for that time lucky, it was a relatively large ring gauge. It was, and, and unpopular. Not, you know, it, the, the, the quantity produced was a reflection of its popularity. People just didn't smoke such thick cigars. How the Sorry, world has I'm, changed. I, I'm enjoying my draw there. Um, I mean, this is. Take your time. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little worried. I'm smoking too quickly. I'm just enjoying this so much. I mean, again, it's continuing to develop. And what are the flavors? I mean, as you're kind of getting into this and the tobacco is warming up, you know, what are you tasting? Mm. Yeah, with, uh, for me at least, um, on my palate, um, you know, you get you get the toasted notes, the toasted tobacco, uh, which sounds obvious. You're burning tobacco, but but there is a certain toastiness that comes through on on really well aged cigars. Um, you get a lot more of the the woody, leathery notes. The the cedar, of course, which is absorbed from the the wood it's contained in anyway. Those are amplified in, in a very old cigar, and the, the the absence of spice, or at least pepper. Mm -hmm. um, Brings out a certain subtle sweetness. It's not an overt sweetness, but but it's 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 more a lack of pepper that that really fills a creamy. It brings a creaminess to the mouth. You know, I, I always come away feeling like I've had a an absolutely delicious, uh, very subtle vanilla. You know, just a hint. Mm, beautiful. Um. All right, up next we've got another interesting box that I don't recognize. Um, let's talk about this one. This is depiction number 45 for Christian, so why don't we pull that up? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> so that, uh, that's a little bit more than a box. That's actually a humidor. 
and um, it was produced in 1992. And it was produced as a celebration of 500 years, hence it's called the 1492 Humidor, the 500 years since Columbus discovered Cuba. And uh, believe it or not, 501 humidors were made, um, date, you know, numbering 0 through 500. And each and every cigar, so there's 50 cigars in each humidor, each one of those, uh, each one of those cigars are individually numbered under each band. So mm -hmm. they will run sequentially. Really? 50 times 501 cigars. And each humidor is numbered as well. And the number denotes a year. So the, the first number would be 1492, and then 1493, and all the way through till 1992. Now that that is a really rare humidor. And at the time, it was um, reasonably expensive, probably not a crazy price, you know, early 90s, 50, 50 count humidor. I think if you were lucky, pushing a thousand pounds probably for a, for a humidor mm -hmm. uh, full of 50 cigars. Today, it is, um, oof, I dread to think, 40, 50, maybe more thousand pounds. Absolutely incredible. I mean, you always pay, I mean, you know, the... Um you know, the Cubans that they release in the humidors are among the most collectible of all of the Cuban cigars because, you know, not only are they limited uh, in their uh, production quantity, um, but also the work that goes into the production uh, of the humidor itself. I, I can't even imagine, you know, something like that, you know, seeing it. It's got to be absolutely just beautiful to open. I mean, it's, a, I mean, it's well, just a piece of art in so many different levels. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a quasi-religious experience when, when you come across that and you have the opportunity to open it, especially after it's been slumbering for, for tens of years. Uh, you know, I remember the first time I, I opened that, uh, God, it was probably 10, 11 years ago, and it hadn't been opened for at least 15, 20 years. Um, it was beautiful, the aroma that came off it, and just the... Just the, the to open it up and it. smell it, I mean, it's got to be, I mean... I mean, I can't imagine what it, I mean, I know what it smells like to walk in the humidor. It smells just magnificent, just all that tobacco. But just to get that kind of aged kind of must and the tobacco aroma, I mean, has to be a kind of part of the ritual. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, it, it's spectacular. Uh, it's a, if they could bottle that, I would buy all the perfume. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, next we've got... Um, you know, some cohibos, which, of course, are, you know, in some ways, I mean, collect me, or correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the most uh, collectible of kind of all of the, of the Cubans. I mean, it's their, you know, their, I don't know what you would call it, their, you know, hallmark brand, if you will, that, uh, their yes. signature brand. Uh, this is, I mean, just the presentation in that box alone looks so uh, precious that it, you'd hate to even break the box. I mean, it's like, you know, you, how do you bring yourself to smoke from that? Yes, uh, that, that's a that's a, a gorgeous, uh, and I probably to to this day, well, perhaps the 50th anniversary gets close to it, but in my opinion, the absolutely most beautiful humidor uh, and cigars. The the story of that um, it's called the Bahica Humidor. It was produced to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Cohiba brand in 2006, and they produced only 100 of them, and it was. Amongst the first time, the first times that they used Elie Bleu, the humidor manufacturer from Paris, as the manufacturer of the humidors. And it's a beautiful chagrin covered humidor, a gorgeous production. The cigars, of course, are even more special because at that time, Bahike did not exist as a brand, as a separate, distinct sort of component of the Cohiba brand. There was no, no previous mention of Bahike. And Norma Fernandez, who was the preeminent roller in El Aguito for, for many, many years, uh, we were very lucky to have her visit the shop when we opened the shop in 1980. She was actually rolling Davidoffs back in the early 80s. Um, she was tasked with rolling each and every single one of these Bahike, uh celebration cigars. 
and they made 100 humidors with 40 cigars each. So that's 4,000 cigars. Each one is individually numbered on the band, um, and every single one was rolled by Norma. It Amazing. is, you know, the, it doesn't get better. Uh, an extraordinary roller using amazing tobacco, packaging them up in an extraordinary special box. Um, even when they came out, I mean, people people were a little dismayed. They were quite expensive relative to other things, but um, you couldn't even get them. You couldn't just say, I'm going to walk into a shop and buy it. Uh, you had to have been picked right at the beginning as a recipient of one of the boxes. And through great fortune, my father was one of those. So if you can see, there's a little brass plaque towards the top left of the picture. Um, each person who bought the box, who it was intended for, their name was inscribed. So my father's name is there, Edward Sahakian. Unbelievable. And uh, that makes it even more special. How many boxes did they make again? They made exactly 100 boxes with 40 cigars in each. Unbelievable. It's almost like owning, you know, a super rare Ferrari. I mean, the supercars. I mean, you know, you can't simply go buy one. Uh, you know, you have to have purchased many Ferraris and have a close relationship, uh, almost be, you know, so, I mean, really, uh, in literal terms, kind of selected by the factory, even to be allocated a vehicle of the production. And it seems that that is exactly the same with a cabinet like that. That's absolutely remarkable. Again, that's I mean, really kind well of a testament put. to your father. I mean, you know that uh, he would even uh, get a box like that. I mean, of course, very well, fitting. Th th thank but, you I very mean, much. That's unbelievable. Wow. And so that's another one that's just sitting there, aging gracefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Occasionally, we pull it out and I stroke it, and I take a few photographs of it, and I tell it I love it, and then we put it back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's almost something that'd be fun to you know, put under a glass case uh, at the front of the shop, you know, just, you know, almost like a museum piece that people could see because, I mean, even, you know, to, to see something like that's quite rare because oftentimes, you know, cigars of that provenance and of that collectability uh, are totally hidden from sight, you know, stored and, you know, behind lock and key, you know, in someone's humidor. Yeah, the, I, 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 I like the idea, Kirby. The only problem is I would have to sleep in the shop. I would be so <laughs> nervous. <laughs> ah, this is, this is just sublime. I mean, you know, to really, um, you know, to fully experience this, I mean, you have to kind of retrohale, which is whenever you, you know, mm -hmm. inhale through your mouth and then without taking it into the lungs, exhale through uh, the nasal passages. And, um, you know, again, sometimes it can be harsh in the beginning, but this is just so sublime and smooth. I mean, even I just want to smell the, um, you know, just, uh, you know, the smoke that's just coming off the front of the cigar. You know, kind of and, of course, you, you're, you're, you're approaching uh, the meat of the cigar now, so you're probably getting towards your, your second half of the cigar and, and this is where the, the strength, when there will be strength, is beginning to develop. And you will begin to pick up some, some really interesting notes as well. Unbelievable. Well, let's look at, um, I think this is the last photograph you, you showed us. This is another exceptionally rare box, it seems. Um, what are we mm. looking at there? <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, uh, that means a lot to me. Um, it was my first trip to Havana, uh, to Cuba at all. It was in 1997, and the occasion was the, the first uh, Habanos Festival. And it was uh, a big deal for me. I'd never been there. I was with my father. Uh, in our little group, we had uh, wonderful friends, people like Desmond Salter, his wife Pamela, uh, and, and numerous friends who, who joined us. And the last night, it all culminated in uh, the festival in the Club Tropicana in Havana. And there were a lot of rumors that Fidel Castro himself may make an appearance. And, you know, that was kind of like saying, you know, Elvis Presley is going to turn up or, you know, or <laughs> dare, dare I say, it, someone equally famous. We were all super excited. 
Yeah. Um, we got there and then um, sat down at the tables and and then we had dinner and then Fidel didn't turn up and then they said, oh no, he's not coming, he's, he's changed his mind. And then suddenly all these fatigued uh, commanders appear around all the tables. Next thing we know, Fidel Castro himself has walked in. And of course, the, the charisma of the man was, was, was a sight to experience, a sight to behold. Uh, he stood up and he began to talk and he addressed all of us. And at that time, a few auctions had been conducted already uh, for the benefit of the, the Cuban children and Cuban medical system. And he said, uh, you know, I've been told that if I sign some some cigars, uh, you know, it'll be good for the auction and more money may be raised for our good causes. So on this occasion, he had signed that particular humidor. And that humidor is number 30 of 30 oh, uh, really? produced to celebrate uh, the, the 30th anniversary. The size, it's a big, it's a big cigar. It was, I believe it was called a double Robusto. Um, and pigtailed, of course, and you can just catch Fidel's signature at the top of the photograph next yeah. to the left of the 30th. Yeah, he dates it a little as bit well. Christian, and we'll see that. Or, you know, actually just scroll up and see if you can roll it out. Yeah, if you scroll up, hopefully you'll, you'll see that. Um, and, and of course, um, I was very lucky. I, I was there. We were, we were watching this auction take place. And Dad was sitting next to me on the on the table, and the, the you know the auction began. And my father, who is normally not one to participate in an auction and lets others enjoy the fun, just couldn't help himself, and he started to bid, and he bid, and he bid, and he bid, <laughs> and next thing I knew, he won. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure as you sit next to him in shock, you know. Like, yes, I was looking over at him thinking. Dad, uh, what about what about the grandchildren? One day I'll have grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have nothing. <laughs> How wrong I was. <laughs> That's funny. It reminds uh, me uh, of an experience I had at the uh, the BTPA, which is the Benevolent Tailors uh, kind of bespoke association uh, in London, and they do an auction similar. And uh, mm -hmm. I had uh, the privilege of sitting at the head table that year uh, with some friends. And they do something very similar where they'll auction some things away, um, you know, to, to benefit uh, the BTBA, which basically kind of provides a pension for a lot of the old tailors uh, that help support them through retirement. And I said, you know, I, this is, I was very graciously invited here uh, by, uh, I think, the head of the auction. And I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, to, um, to bid on something. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to bid on whatever the smallest hopefully most inexpensive thing is at that auction, which was a <laughs> pair of uh, a pair of slippers. And, um, you know, so I'm like, you know, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 400 pounds. And I look back and uh, it's me and Anda Roland, you know, the head of uh, Anderson and Shepard, you know, bidding against each other. And I was thinking, oh, my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? And it was one of those things that I said, you know, I'm not going to let this get away from me. I think I ended up paying something like six or 700 pounds uh, for a pair of, you know, slippers, you know, something that probably cost 200 And afterwards, I gulped, you know, and said, well, this will be something I remember. <laughs> but it was, you know, again, you just, you know, you get caught up in, you know, the memories that these types of experiences produces uh, is amazing. Unfortunately, my investment in those slippers, you know, sh uh, aren't quite as collectible as, you know, that beautiful humidor there, but at least it produced a nice memory for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet, Kirby. Just wait a few more years. You never know. <laughs> I should have asked someone to sign them. Um, and this leads me <laughs> to the next Hallmark collectible. This is our next image, and it's one that, of course, you'll recognize. Um, Christian, that's your cue. There we go. The, um, you know, uh, the Davidoff of London 40th anniversary cigar, dare I say. Uh, next... Um, you know, next one that you know we'll be filming a video and hopefully smoking about in twenty or thirty years' time. Well, th thank you so much, Kirby. That's that's incredibly dear to our hearts. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the in the broadcast that it had been our fortieth anniversary on the twenty ninth of May of, of the opening of the shop, and about two and a half years ago, um, Davidoff uh, and ourselves, Davidoff in, in Basel, 
uh, we started talking about producing a cigar uh, special enough to, to, to commemorate that occasion. And um, from our side, our brief was, was relatively straightforward. I think we said uh, our favorite size, which is the number two size, uh, sometimes known as a Corona Special size in Cuba. Uh, this was the original size my father had fallen in love with uh, back in the 70s when he first uh, enjoyed Davidoff cigars. And uh, back in 2005, we celebrated our 25th anniversary of the shop. On that occasion, Davidoff also produced a number two size cigar uh, to celebrate the London anniversary. And uh, it was a lighter Dominican blending. So this time we, we said, let's do the same size, but let's go a little different on the blend. And Davidoff did the most extraordinary selection of blends for us. And, you know, we didn't make it easy for them. I told them I wanted the Art Edition uh, 2014, the Art Edition 2016 Davidoff blends, something like that. And they came back um, with a few options. The particular one we settled on was inspired by those blends, but had a unique set of five different Dominican fillers uh, inside the cigar. Uh, that means there's seven different tobaccos in, in, overall in the cigar, uh, which is really difficult to achieve in, in a ring gauge of, of, that, of that dimension. Um, it arrived in the shop in about two months ago. We were going to launch it, of course, for the 29th of May, but, but circumstances overtook us. And um, we have, I have to say, been enjoying each and every one. We've smoked a few now. And it is a medium to full-bodied, rich, uh, tasty, spicy cigar. We've only made 300 boxes of 10, and uh, they are available now. Uh, but our view with this one is that it has the potential to age for, for a very long time. And uh, we hope in another 15 years, perhaps we will be having another live stream together, Kirby, talking about that very cigar and how it's hopefully improved in those 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, well, I've got, um, I've got the one that you sent right here as a taster. And I have to, have to say, this is a box that, um, that I've already committed to purchasing. And it's available on the website. I hesitate to say that, but uh, you've, you've heard me right now. So regardless of what happens to the rest of those during this live stream, one of these <laughs> uh, boxes uh, will be earmarked for me. And um, so I'm going to just open this up for everyone, for them to see. Now this was, you sent this, it doesn't have a cellophane. Is this something that would come cellophane wrapped? I mean, look at this beautiful uh, kind of yes. dark wrapper. Yes, so what normally it would be this? cellophane wrapped in, in, the, in the box. Uh, I took it out for you to, to be able to enjoy uh, the aroma, I think. And, and I, I imagine on the nose you can already smell uh, a very different flavor profile there. Absolutely. I mean, it's a darker wrapper for one. Um, yes. Is this that, that's a Maduro Habano wrapper? Ecuador wrapper. Uh, not quite a Maduro. No, it's, it's, it's called the Habano Ecuador. And Davidoff um, have a, a really beautiful selection of wrappers they use. The one we, we, we love the most is the one they use on their 702 series, which is exactly that wrapper. It's the Habano Ecuador. Um, it's something very special. But, you know, Davidoff have... Uh, have a secret weapon, have a few secret weapons, and uh, they come in the, the name of the, the, the Kellner family, in particular Henke and, of course, his son. Mm -hmm. um, we had on and the of last live stream with you and your father. That's Special right. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and, of course, Eladio Diaz, who, who is the master blender there, and he also worked on our 25th anniversary cigar. You know, they've got such an extraordinary, there he is, it's Klaus Kellner, and... Um, and they make extraordinary cigars. And it's really only when you visit them and you see what goes into their production, the growing, the cultivation, the, the preservation of, of the right ways to do tobacco, mm -hmm. that you can fully appreciate what you have in your hand. Every single Davidoff they make is, is a piece of art and tastes beautiful. So I hope it'll be true for the, for the 40th anniversary as well for you. For you. Uh, well, we've certainly enjoyed it so far. It's um, an absolutely beautiful, beautiful cigar. And again, uh, very elegant kind of format and ring gauge. Um, and, uh, you know, beautiful wrapper. 
uh, or a beautiful band, of course, the Davidoff um, band that, of course, is uh, iconic, uh, but also the addition of the secondary band, 1980, London to 2020. Um, Amazing. Are there any other anniversary uh, cigars that uh, you said they did the 30th anniversary cigar also? I mean, it has the big the tail, 25th. too. It's kind of hard to see here, but because uh, it's quite, quite small, but uh, it has kind of that pigtail at the end. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah, they did the 25th anniversary as well, and the 25th anniversary is um, exactly the same shape, format, pigtail, um, and, uh, you know, our only regret with that box is that we didn't keep more. Uh, we have very few of those left and they have aged really well. So <laughs> my father is already uh, press ganging me into putting a, a, a large quantity of boxes into his personal keep and not selling them. So <laughs> we're yeah, going to have goes, fun there. It goes, in, it goes into the family vault, if you will. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Wow. What are some of the, um, I mean, any interesting kind of, you know, stories or memories that kind of intertwine with, you know, just, you know, being a purveyor of, of just these fine and rare cigars and kind of the hands that they go into? I mean, of course, uh, you guys take such great care of these cigars, you know, looking after them in your humidor, aging them perfectly. Um, but ultimately, I mean, you know, the cigars all need to be smoked and enjoyed by someone. Um, any interesting kind of anecdotes of kind of some of your, uh, you know, customers that are connoisseurs and collectors and, you know, kind of how they go about, you know, choosing which of these amazing cigars to, to enjoy? Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the real, um, it's the real silver lining to, to, to the job I do. And um, if you enjoy people, which, which my father does and I do, and, and I hope the, our staff at Davidoff represents as well, uh, then we are the luckiest people in the world doing the best job in the world because we get to welcome people at the happiest moment of their shopping experience. It could be anyone, but if they love a cigar, already they're walking into your store uh, ready to be made happier than they were when they first walked in and and nothing gives me greater pleasure than than sharing a little bit of my knowledge but ultimately guiding a customer towards finding the right cigar for them and a day does not pass when i don't learn from my customers and you know as much as uh, i've learned over the years from my father and from my own research and and, and practice with cigars there is always a customer who knows more, who's done it for longer, who has a different opinion, who has a different viewpoint on, on what's a good cigar and the best way to enjoy them. And that is the extraordinary moment when you meet someone like that and, and I sit down and I become the student again and I learn from the customer. And then of course the magic moment where if we're lucky and time permits, he has the opportunity to sit down and we get to share a cigar and talk about it. And exchange opinions um, you know we're lucky we, we, we get customers from from all over the world not at the present moment for obvious reasons but normally and um, the extraordinary uh, truism about a cigar connoisseur and a cigar someone who enjoys a cigar is that they tend to be interesting people with a, a true passion in life for many things and they don't accept second best. So they are willing to, to go as far as it takes to get the best watch, to get the best shoes, to get the best clothes, to get the best cigars, the best wines that their budget permits. And I'm the same. For me, life is too short to waste on mediocrity. Um, I know we can't all afford to, to buy everything we want, but whatever our means permit, Buy the best that you can reach with those means, and you will live a good life. I'm certain of that. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I love about a cigar. Um, and, you know, I enjoy fine wine, but I have to say, you know, kind of cigars are kind of my own personal indulgence. I mean, it's really what I enjoy. I enjoy the, the ritual, the time, the company, 
uh, the history, uh, how it is so closely intertwined with just, um, you know, kind of the British gentleman uh, kind of throughout the ages. And that uh, smoking a great cigar is certainly, I think, one of the ways to really enjoy that uh, and to make it a part of your own lifestyle, right? I mean, you know, I feel like whenever you smoke a great cigar, you know, you really kind of self-select and bring yourself into that world and all of a sudden you're a part of that tradition and you're a part of that history. Uh, and, um, you know, even if it's just a few cigars a year, I think that, um, you know, it's certainly an occasion worth doing well and doing properly. And if you have the, the opportunity or if you have the, um, you know, the desire uh, to take it up, I think beginning to, you know, like yeah, I've got my humidor right here to kind of, you know, collect your own boxes, uh, to kind of begin aging some of your own cigars, which I'm trying to do there. Uh, it's really, I think, even, even better. Uh, but I think taking it to the next level, and I've got a few things to show kind of from my collection, um, no. is to then to be able to kind of invest in some of those really collectible cigars that you can kind of cherish onto the next level. And I've been fortunate enough uh, to be able to kind of acquire, you know, two. One, I acquired another one was a very generous gift from you and your father. Uh, but this is the Ramon Ayones. Uh, you know, this was the 225th anniversary, again, limited to a series of uh, 2,000 boxes of 25. And uh, I have to admit that I've, I've smoked a few from this, uh, but <laughs> only on a very a special occasion with a, a good company. And uh, this is an absolutely beautiful cabinet. And I still remember... I still remember, you know, being in the shop with you, Eddie, as you kind of pulled this out and we kind of selected this and uh, you set it aside for me. And, um, you know, this will be something that, again, I'll smoke very slowly, uh, only on, again, the most kind of special occasion. And uh, I really cherish uh, as a part of my humidor. Um, and, again, it just further kind of enhances and elevates, you know, just the memory uh, in the moment, really, I think, you know. And so I've got this box. I need to put this back inside. I'll do that in a second as to keep it as a full Yeah, box. look after those carefully, Kirby. Yeah. That's, that's a really beautiful box you have there. It really, I mean, it is uh, beautifully rolled. Uh, and uh, this is another one, which is the El Rey de Mundo, which I had the privilege of kind of picking up with you and your father the last time I was in London. My favorite format, which, of course, is the Lancero, and um, I'm not going to pull these completely out. I've, I've made the, unfortunately, I've liked this so much that I, I have to say I've gotten, I got into it a little quickly, and I think I've already had, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know how much is on the top row. I've probably had four of these, uh, but an absolutely just sublime Lancero. Uh, we'll see if we can get that right here. Well, you know, I can tell you how many you've had, Kirby, because... The format is quite an unusual format. It's an 888 box. Yeah, oh, I've had so, five then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that as five glorious hours well I spent. I know, five glorious <laughs> hours well spent. And, you know, the next, the next box, and again, I mean, I'd say that my means are, are quite limited, but, um, you know, the next box that is going to be added to my humidor uh, will, without question, be the 40th anniversary cigar because whenever I look back and smoke those, you know, I really want to think that every single time I smoke one of those, I'm celebrating alongside you and your father. Um, you. I need to Thank take you. your that father's advice and, 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 in fact, get two boxes, one to smoke fun and then one just to keep. Well, I was going to suggest that, but I didn't want to appear too commercial. <laughs> so... Um, I mean, it's so much fun. That's one of the things I really love about beautiful cigars is, um, you know, at least in your own way, you know, trying to collect a little bit. Um, and this, I mean, again, I can only imagine kind of with the darker wrapper uh, how this will really age uh, so well because as it ages, it'll retain um, more body and more flavor. Am, am I right? Yes, for sure. And, and, and uh, with the box you'll find, uh, because they're cellophane wrapped, uh, you're going to get a very, very slow maturation and additional fermentation there. So they will persist and develop uh, some really beautiful flavors for, I, I hope to say, decades. 
So I think Co I might, Cody, I might need to relight this. Um, That's fine. By the way, there's no trouble relighting a cigar. You know that, I, I'm sure. Just brush off the head of ash and then relight it. Yeah, sorry. What were you saying, Eddie? Well, just a question for you. Do, do you ever keep the bands of cigars that are particularly memorable? You know, I don't have a, um, a great practice, but uh, I was just noticing that the band on this one kind of broke loose. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as the cigar and the tobacco heats up, uh, any of those kind of residual adhesives. So I'm going to do this right now for everyone to see. I'm going to pull this off very delicately, still intact. Uh, and I was actually thinking, kind of as I was smoking this, uh, what will be an appropriate way to, um, you know, to commemorate that. I was thinking about, I don't know, putting it in a shadow box or something, or I don't know. Um, <laughs> but what about you? Know, I mean, uh, Kirk, uh, go on. Sorry, I, I, was just, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to say I have a, a, a customer, a lovely customer, who who had a habit of, still has the habit of keeping the bands of the cigars he smokes, especially the very memorable ones. But what is remarkable about him, he has a very fine tipped pen and he actually writes on the back of the band the date and his impressions of the cigar he smoked. Mm. And when I say he writes, he writes in such minuscule writing that he probably gets a good paragraph in there. Does he really? <laughs> I, wow. I saw that. I think you need a magnifying glass to read what he's written. But, but you know, he's got a story behind each band. <laughs> That's amazing. And I'll, I'll just throw this on the pen again to kind of show, you know, again, the size of this, again, so perfectly kind of approximating that of a fine writing instrument. Also intertwined, I feel like, you know, this, this, um, you know, this world of kind of connoisseurship of, of being able to really enjoy and appreciate fine things, uh, but not so much art on a wall that you look at, but something that you can truly experience, writing with a fine instrument, wearing nice, finely tailored clothing, smoking a great cigar, drinking a great whiskey, a fine cognac. Um, you know, it's really a special uh, almost um, category of connoisseurship that um, I feel like is at its best. Kirby, out of curiosity, what, what is the weather like where you are? Is it, is it particularly humid at the moment? You know, it's not. Well, I mean, particularly, it's all relative, I suppose. I mean, you know, I have to say it's heating up quite a bit. Um, you know, we're getting into the Texas summer. Um, not nearly as humid in Dallas as it is in Houston. Um, so I couldn't tell you the probably 50% humidity. I, don't, I have to, would have to check. Okay. You know, with, with all, these, all these cigars, it's always worth trying them at different humidities in the ambient. Uh, and I found that uh, every cigar you smoke in the Caribbean, be it Cuban, non-Cuban, always tastes beautiful. And my father and I are both convinced that's due to the ambient humidity. So if you get a particularly humid day, uh, just pull out one of your favorite cigars and see, see how it tastes when you smoke it. Yeah. How long will you let it, uh, you know, sit? I mean, I've heard your father, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of has, you know, two humidors at home, one that he kind of ages his fine stock in, but one that he, uh, is at a slightly higher humidity uh, of his sticks that he'll actually pull from and smoke. Yes, I mean, he's, 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 he's quite funny. My father, my father enjoys his cigars on the slightly drier side. So he is um, renowned for, for leaving his cigars in the, call it the room environment rather than a humidor environment. Uh, for several hours, if not a day, before smoking it. And, um, and it's just a matter of personal taste. He finds it burns better. He finds he enjoys the flavor profile more. Um, whereas I tend to smoke a little bit more straight out of the humidor, um, unless it's very, very humid. I mean, there, there are exceptions. But, but generally speaking, we, we have probably a, a difference of preference of about eight or nine relative humidity percentage mm. points. <laughs> If I could quantify it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, of course, the um, the more humid the cigar becomes, slightly spongier it'll be to the touch. It'll be, you know, kind of wetter in the literal sense. 
uh, and yes. the slower they generally burn too if it's uh, at a slightly higher humidity. Yes, yes, exactly right. Uh, it's a fine balance. You don't want it to go too so it burns too hot and too quickly, nor do you want it too humid uh, where it's not burning enough uh, and is is really being relit constantly. Um, you know the 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 main excuse for relighting a cigar is the best one, which is the company is so good and the conversation is so good that you forget to puff on your cigar. Uh, <laughs> those are a good excuse for relighting, but relighting just because every puff it goes out that's not a good reason. <laughs> To say, I mean, as I smoke this, I mean, I can, you know, although it's had so much time to ferment, I still feel like I'm certainly getting some nicotine in this. And, um, you know, it's quite a long cigar. And even though it's uh, very soft and subtle, it's certainly building. And I'm also getting some yes. residual flavor in the mouth, uh, which is quite, quite nice. Yeah, that, that's, I, I'm the same. This, this final third, and even more so if you get to the last maybe two, three inches. Um, it's still remarkable how much uh, development will take place, how much new flavor comes through. And, you know, if, if you picked the cigar up at this stage and started smoking it, uh, you wouldn't consider it a 30-year-old cigar. And, and I think this is where the very graduated aging that we practice in the shop uh, comes, to, comes to the fore. Uh, it allows you to still experience flavor and personality in, in you know, the reason is, of course, there can be 30-year-old cigars that have no personality left. And that is the same as, you know, we talked about wine. It's the same as enjoying uh, an overaged wine where mm -hmm. the, the peak is passed and what you're left with is just the flavor of alcohol. Um, it's the same with an overaged cigar. You know, you can sometimes be very disappointed and have just hot air and smoke with no personality. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just reaching back into the humidor real quick because I've got a box of cigars that I purchased that I think in some ways, uh, push this back in, excuse me. So this was uh, after the last time I was in London and uh, I was enjoying that Lancero with you and your father so much, I kind of resolved myself to try to hunt down some other Lanceros. And I think it was on one of these live streams that someone recommended uh, the Sancho Panza. Panza? No, this was actually from a friend of mine at my club in, um, in uh, Paris was actually recommending. This is a gentleman that, you know, probably you know. And um, he was uh, recommending this. Oh, that's a spectacular box of cigars. It's, that's the same size as a Monte Cristo A. Well, I have to so say, I mean, I've had one of these. And it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a quite, a, quite a long smoke. You're right, there's not a, it's actually not a, a Lancero. Um, and let's see when this box is dated. Um, because this kind of takes me, so this is dated 2000. Uh, and I would say that, um, you know, I've only smoked one of these, uh, but I found it to be almost too mellow. I mean, there was really nothing left mm -hmm. of this. And so, it kind of brings me to my next question, which is, can you overage a cigar? Uh, and of course, if it's not done in the right conditions, I mean, this uh, unfortunately didn't come from you, so I, I can't vouch for the provenance in terms of how it was cared for. Um, but I have to say, I, I had one, and I probably should give it a second chance and smoke a second one uh, before really kind of forming my opinion. But I felt that this kind of was an example of a cigar that had just been overaged. Yes, uh, you know, it, it, it can happen, and, um, and it's difficult to know which one and how long it will be before it does reach that point. There, you know, there is, some, there is some positive news for you, Kirby, because we found, uh, even with some of our Cuban Davidoffs and some of our very old cigars, that the conventional wisdom is, once it's gone through, call it a, a peak of, personality and character, then it sort of fades away over time. That, that fading away is, is a one-way street, but actually we found that there's a miraculous resurrection that can happen with some cigars, that they go through a period and you think that's it, it's finished, there's no more personality and you sort of forget it. 
and then two, three years later, you come back to it, and it's come back. Something magical has happened, and I don't think there's anyone in the cigar world who could tell you scientifically why and how it happens, but it does happen. So with those Sanchos, be patient. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, but wait a little longer, and you may be wonderfully well surprised. Um, you know, I've, I've had ones of exactly that cigar from, from the mid-90s, and a few years ago, I felt the same, that they'd gone through the, the best of their life. And then they did come back. And um, if I may give you a hint with, with the Sancho, something that worked really well for me, uh, we had a tasting in, in Mark's Club about two years ago with, with one of our friends, Darius Namda. Uh, he's, he's famous in the UK because he won the Habano Sommelier competition in Cuba, uh, which is unheard of as a non-Cuban. Wow. Yeah. And he presented a Sancho, an H Sancho, for the dinner. And what we did, which worked beautifully, we lit the cigar before we started dinner, which is very unusual. And it was very light, as you found with yours. We smoked about half of it. And then we had our dinner. And then we came back to the cigar for the second half. And, all, you know, you had pretty much a long Robusta left to enjoy Mm -hmm. And it worked beautifully because, of course, the personality had developed and the second half of the cigar suited a postprandial smoke, whereas the first half was ideal for a preprandial. And so it's the first time in my life I've actually tasted one cigar before and after a meal and found both halves being perfect for that moment. So mm -hmm. that could be something to try uh, when you're next... Uh, curious about the box. Yeah, I'll have to give that a shout out. I'll, I'll smoke it al fresco, you know, outside <laughs> and um, <clears throat> we'll split it up before and after dinner. I really like the idea with that. Um, so a few questions just from uh, uh, the, uh, our company that are, are smoking alongside of us. Uh, one of them is, um, you know, whenever you guys open back up on Monday, I mean, if someone wanted to come by and purchase a Davidoff number one, I mean, maybe from this exact same box, uh, is this something that someone could inquire about and come by and yes, have the opportunity sure. to acquire? Yes, uh, absolutely. Come in, ask ask myself or any of my staff, um, and we will absolutely be able to help with that. Yeah. What other uh, of the Davidoffs kind of of this era uh, are amongst your favorite to smoke? Um, I mean, the number one, but I mean, there's the number twos that you were referencing. Uh, yeah. I mean, how do they the, differ, the, and you know, how do you think about those? Yeah, the, the, the number two is the same blend. It's a shorter variant of the same blend. So same ring gauge, just shorter. Uh, so it's a very similar smoking experience until the very end. Uh, I find that the Lancero size, the number one size, uh, will develop a bit more impact at the end just because you've smoked more of the cigar by the time you get to that point. Uh, obviously, smoking time will, will differ as well. On the number two size, expect about 45 minutes, uh, maybe an hour if you, if you go slowly. Whereas with the number one, you can stretch it to an hour, hour and a half even. Um, if, if you ask me right now which, which old Cuban Davidoff I'm enjoying the most, it's probably the 3000, the really, really thin, uh, slim Panatella that is um, unfortunately very rare, but it is so delicious. It's such a, such a great smoke. I'll have to write that down. That'll be my celebration cigar for whenever I finally make it back to London. <laughs> is a Cuban Davidoff, a Cuban Davidoff 3000, uh, hopefully in your good company, uh, in the uh, the tasting, uh, uh, in the tasting chairs uh, there that you have. I'll be looking forward to show. that. Um, another question, which I think is a very, you know, great question, which is uh, of amongst the uh, kind of current da uh, Cubans, right? Davidoff included also. Uh, do you have particular favorites that you think might be uh, better predisposed for long-term aging? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, all of them. You know, I mean, I'm sure all of them could be an answer, uh, but if you were to say, you know what, these are particularly well-suited for aging. Well, you know, I'll, I'll preamble my answer a little bit by saying um, there, there was a conventional wisdom that said, the stronger a blend, the longer it will have the potential to age and improve. Um, I disagree with that completely. 
because we've found um, some of the lightest blends from Cuba, whether they're Upmans or El Rey del Mundos or Hoya de Monterrey's, uh, even some of the light blend Davidoffs, uh, have aged just as well, if not better, than a Bolivar or a Barbagas uh, or even a Cohiba. So I don't believe that for a start, and that's my preamble. And then if we zone in on what's out there right now, um, you know, because we can't guarantee that a strength or a particular size is going to age better than any other, my overriding advice would be pick cigars that you yourself enjoy, that the size, the blend you like, uh, put those away. That is going to be the best for, for the person, you know, as a personal word of advice. Um, if you are putting many away and you think that you may uh, in the future trade a few of those boxes and you know rotate your stock in that way, then you need to have an eye on the potential future value of, of the stock you want to keep and, and age. And if you're doing that, then you need to start aiming for the limited productions, uh, the very collectible regional editions. You know, La Reina is a very good example. The Ramon Alonas that you, you showed us earlier, wonderful example. Uh, any Cohiba limited edition is normally a good candidate for, for price appreciation. Um, and uh, if you can pick up the odd you know, regionals from, from other countries, you know, there's, an amazing, um, there's an amazing Italian regional edition uh, by La Spezion. The brand is called La Spezion, and it's a, it's a number two size, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that came out several years ago. You know, that's a beauty, and I will put my hand on my heart and say I am sure it's going to improve for, for many, many more years. So, you know, don't limit yourself to, to one market. You know, look across the markets. Um, and in recent years, I think non-Cuban production as well. You know, we, we used to think that, that the non-Cuban New World cigars, Dominicans and Nicaraguans and so on, uh, they were fermented so well before being rolled that the opportunity to change with time after they'd been rolled was limited. But actually, we found, you know, we've dug up some old Dominican Davidoffs from the 90s, you know, mid-90s mm. to late 90s. Uh, the Millennium Blends, the Churchills, uh, the 3000s that were Dominican Blends, you know, and these have changed beautifully as well. So, so we stand corrected on our original thought. Uh, so again, my advice to, to, to our customers, if they, if they have a palate for, for non-Cubans, you know, don't be shy. You know, buy a few extra boxes, put them away, put the date on the box so you yourself remember when you put that away. Um, and just revisit them after five years, six years, ten years, see what you think. Beautiful advice. Beautiful advice. Well, anyone that's watching, if you guys have additional questions for Eddie, uh, by all means, uh, you know, type them in the comments section. I'd be more than happy to convey those. Um, but this has just been an absolutely splendid treat. I think, um, I think the next time I'm in London, uh, we'll need to, um, you know, maybe do some planning and put together a little cigar dinner. I think that would be fun to get some of our fellow uh, kind of friends and enthusiasts, um, you know, all, all in the, all in good company smoking, maybe some special cigars, uh, maybe over uh, dinner uh, and uh, some nice, um, you know, champagne or other drinks. I, I like the sound of that, Kirby. And, you know, at the moment, our government has this uh, quarantine requirement, a 14-day quarantine. So uh, I invite you, Kirby, to take that 14-day quarantine in our shop and we <laughs> will... Uh... <laughs> You may you not, you'll have to drag me out, drag me out by my feet. <laughs> no, no, we'll have to keep you there for 14 days and I'll have to join you there. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I've got a, um, I'll see if I can pull this up on my phone. Uh, I sent this to a friend, um, very kind of poignant. I don't know if we can get this on Can B. Um, I'm going to actually, Christian, I'm going to send this to you. And uh, can I send this to you? Or do you think you can get it? We'll see it. Uh, it's not quite focused. Anyway, I'll read it to you. It says, uh, how did you survive the coronavirus, Dad? And it uh, says, uh, I smoked cigars and drank a shit ton of whiskey. And his father, his son goes, uh, you know, uh, you know, F, uh, F and legend. <laughs> uh, I'll 
I'll send that to, I wonder if I can, that would be fun to kind of pull up. Let me see if I can link that. There we go. I'll send this. But, uh, you know, it definitely is, um, I think, indicative of how I've gotten through this. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and probably a lot of people, I mean, we've all been stuck at home. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the clear winners have been, uh, you know, probably, um, you know, any of the, the spirits or wine companies, uh, alcohol, of course, I think their sales have, have just uh, skyrocketed. And probably, I think you were saying, yeah, there it goes right there. I can't repeat that on screen, but... Um, <laughs> so true. I like how I don't. I can't tell if you. I don't think he's smoking right there, but uh, you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> I share the sentiments of the young man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, let's see. So uh, Williams Watches is asking again. You know, can I purchase a 1991 Cuban from Evie? And I think the answer is, of course, uh, yes. Um, I mean, I imagine that you still have some of these tucked away in a corner of the aging room, and, um, you know, they can uh, see that. Do you have a list anywhere of, of the uh, kind of aged cigars that are available, or is this something that someone really just has to come in and kind of inquire about? You know, we, we, um, we can put together a list. We don't have a, uh, a formal one that, that we can sort of hand out uh, on request. But if someone asks and they give us an idea of what they're looking for, uh, given a little bit of time, we can put together what's currently available. Um, you know, the reason we don't, it's, it's a very simple one. Firstly, the stock we hold in some of them is very, very limited. So literally one customer can, can transform the availability of, of those cigars. And the other reason is um, the price changes box by box. So. Um, as we get down to our dwindling stocks of, of irreplaceable cigars, mm -hmm. uh, the price will, will go up uh, as each box disappears from our key. Um, and that's um, the other reason. We can't stick to the, the same list yeah. at, at all times. Absolutely. What about, I mean, <clears throat> what's the I mean, oldest cigar in your collection uh, that you guys currently have? Ooh. I would say probably from the 1930s. Really? Um, and and that was not that was not a cigar that um, was originally purchased by us from the importers. Of course, it it predates us by a long time. In fact, predates my father. Um, that particular box I picked up in an auction a few years ago from our dear friend uh, Mitchell Orchard. You know, he has some a wonderful. Um, cigar auction site called onlinecigarauctions.com uh, and uh, several years ago there was a cabinet of 50 uh, Ramon Alonis cigars from the 1930s and they're called Trumps ah, okay. and I knew, I knew there are a box of 50 and that was before Donald uh, was yeah. voted in as a, as a president so so I acquired them because they're beautiful I mean the condition the box the wrapper, the, everything about them was, was extraordinary. Uh, I've never smoked them, but the aroma is still there, and I hope one day to, to, to crack those open and enjoy them. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, what about, um, what's the oldest cigar that you've smoked? Uh, ooh, I was very lucky. I, I was given uh, a cigar that uh, I think it was being auctioned at the time. This was in the 1990s. I think it was being auctioned at Christie's, if I'm not mistaken, and they, they wanted us to provide some provenance for the seller. <laughs> tough, and, um, tough job there. It was a tough job, and Dad and I both had a chance to smoke. Uh, it was a very small cigar, perfecto shape, and it was unbanded. What we knew was that the cigars were from the 19th century. Really? And they'd been wow. discovered in, in an old house somewhere, I forget where exactly, um, and I have to say, um, they were probably better kept as a piece of history rather than smoked. They, they were not, uh, there was not much flavor left there. Mm -hmm. But it was still extraordinary to me that I could be smoking a 100-year-old cigar and still generating smoke and flame and fire. You know, that, that, was, that was a seminal moment. Absolutely. Amazing. 
I think that actually answers uh, maybe Romy's question, which is, you know, a highly anticipated cigar that didn't smoke quite uh, as you anticipated. Um, do you um, do you see you know out of the current kind of production any future classics? Hmm. Yeah, I, I you know I I keep coming back to to certainly La Reina. Um, you know, I personally, you know, I I, I don't mean to. Uh, to say what I do is necessarily what's going to be a future classic, but um, the way it's been received, the way it's smoked, you know, the, the history, the story of La Reina, it's all produced in the Elegito factory, which is mm -hmm. very unusual for a non Cohiba brand. Um, and of course, it's in the Lancero format. Yeah, reserved for Cohibas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So there were only three rollers in the whole of the Elegito factory who rolled all, the entire production of La Reina cigars and the construction has been remarkable on the cigars and of course the tobacco that is typically produced and distributed to Elegito for production is the very very best of what Cuba produces so the the key factors that you would look at, at the beginning are all there A really good roller really good factory uh, really good tobacco uh, and then of course it's a limited production run so you have that working to your advantage. Um, and even though El Rey del Mundo is, is a relatively light blend, um, I have no doubt that you know, in 10, 20, maybe even 30 years time, it's still going to be a highly sought after cigar. Yeah, that's amazing. So MH is asking whether or not we'd consider offering cigars on the website. And I think that the... Uh, a uh, short answer would be, uh, I don't know if I'm ready to get into the tobacco business quite yet, but I think it is a, it's actually kind of a <clears throat> little kind of pet dream of mine to, you know, maybe work with, um, you know, with uh, the hinkies out of, um, you know, Davidoff, you know, to maybe come up with kind of our own special blend and maybe do a limited production. I think that would be really neat to kind of have something uh, to kind of call our own and maybe put our stamp on and, uh, to be able to enjoy. Well, you, you, you nailed it, Kirby. You could not have picked a better person to do it with uh, across the whole industry. And if I could put my hand up now and say, can you keep a few boxes for me? Yeah, well, it would be fun to do together. We should, uh, you know, you, you have to let me know the next time you go down there, I'll fly and meet you all. And, uh, you know, we could have some fun kind of tasting and maybe putting something, something special, maybe in a, you know, maybe a, you know, a few dozen boxes uh, to kind of that, That's a deal. That's a deal. I'll be honored to, 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 to help in any way, shape, or form. Mm. I'm going to burn my, my fingers on this one. Now, people are asking now, you know, I have to say, we have a very limited selection of cigar accessories, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually, have you ever used the El Casco cigar cutter, Eddie? If not, I'm going to send one of these to you. Uh, you, of course, you know, I... Uh, that uh, risking uh, offending you, uh, given that you are the resident expert in all things cigars, I have to say, this has, uh, you know, been the most pleasurable cutter I've ever used, and we have a limited stock of these that we've. It's a back ordered right now. But I think we've got more on the way. Um, well, so I, I would love, I would love to try that, uh, Kirby. If if you if you wouldn't mind when you get more stock, if you could send me one. I would love to put that in my shop as the one we use to cut customer cigars. Oh, that'd be um, great. And that is the ultimate test of a cutter. Well, absolutely. This is, um, I mean, I always find guillotine cutters is, or butterfly cutters, you know, with the two blades. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't do it, if it's not sharp and if it's not done properly, I mean, you can really ruin a cigar if um, you botch the cutting. Um, and um, maybe it was in my younger years, lack of practice before I discovered this. Uh, but this thing right here, I mean, it just really slices through uh, the uh, end or the butt of the cigar with uh, really Swiss precision, even though it's from Spain. Um, mm -hmm. And I've never had a bad cut. You know, Kirby, could I ask you, with, with your expertise in, in fine leather, obviously with your knowledge on shoes and, 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 and the, the hides that are used for that, um, I think if you put your mind to selecting some extraordinary hides to make a cigar case through. Um, that could really be interesting as well. And I would love to see someone with your expertise picking, picking a beautiful finish, a beautiful patinaed hide, 
and producing something for cigar smokers. I would be a, definitely one of your customers for that. Well, that is it's a great idea. We'll have to work on that. I like, I like the idea of it. Um, and uh, again, I mean, if you smoke a fine cigar, I mean, you really do pick up uh, kind of the leather. Mm-hmm. Mm. <coughs> ha. Ha. I inhaled a little, little too deeply on that one. <laughs> I've got that in the lungs. Ha. So, Eddie, another good question from my good friend, Oil Greenway, who is a recipient of our, our anniversary tie, uh, which I think he just received, um, which is, um, do you kind of have... Um, you know, kind of any cigar smoking icons that whenever you think um, that you think about, you just to to you just in some ways kind of personify, personify or exemplify uh, just you know elegant smoking. Uh, uh, there's there's many. I mean, I, I uh, the one of the dearest for me uh, because of our association with our shop is is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, he uh, visited us from the very early days that the shop was open and uh, was, has always been a true, true cigar connoisseur. And his, his palate, his appreciation of cigars is next to, you know, next to all the legends of the cigar world. He's up there with his palate. So I've always admired his, his taste. He started with the Dom Perignons and, you know, moved on. So <laughs> he knows what he's smoking. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, I really admire the man who is, um, you know, able to go and, uh, you know, really enjoy at that level. Um, who else? Anyone else that you kind of think of? Well, um, you know, I suppose, uh, you know, historic figures, not, not ones I've met personally, but, you know, Winston Churchill is, is, is of course, uh, an archetype for the cigar smoker. And, um, you know the way he enjoyed cigars, and I think the way he enjoyed life uh, is a is a, is a very interesting uh, you know, uh, example for us all. Um, in in more recent in more recent years, um, you know there have been some real personalities uh, who visited the shop. Um, one that sticks out in my mind is uh, is Whoopi Goldberg. Oh really? And, uh, she, oh she she was. You know, I think the first time I met her was in the 90s when she visited the shop. Um, not just because she's, again, a, a real connoisseur of cigars, but her personality is infectious. She is such, she is so entertaining, warm, funny in, in, her, in, her, in her everyday persona. You know, she's not just a screen persona. She's a real funny person. And the way she enjoyed cigars, again, you know, it was an example for me. It was just, you know, here's someone loving every, every puff of that cigar. Yeah. Um, Have you had any uh, interesting diplomats or any heads of state or um, shoot any uh, British kind of aristocracy or royalty that has kind of walked in the shop and surprised you? Uh, you know, um, we've, we've had the great pleasure of welcoming Lord Lindy, who... Um, is, is a famous uh, joiner and cabinet maker in his own right. And he's always been fond of cigars. And we've had that pleasure in, in the past. Um, in terms of heads of state that really stand out, um, the late King of Jordan, he used to visit the shop and, and he was um, very friendly with my father. Uh, and what always struck me uh, at the time, I was a young boy working in the shop really, you know, in the 90s again, um, was whenever, whenever he visited the shop, he made a concerted effort to talk to all the staff in the shop. He would shake hands with everyone. He would greet everyone. He would treat each and every person in the shop as an equal and, uh, and with, with great grace, uh, a, a, a humility that you did not expect from someone in his position. So, you know, that, again was a beautiful sight to behold. And um, I was very happy to have had the pleasure to meet him uh, whilst he was still on this earth. Yeah. Another interesting question. This is one that I often think about, which is um, you're joining us right now from your father's smoking room. Uh, but if you were to kind of build your own kind of dream smoking room, uh, what would be in it? I like that ring. Ooh. That was another question. Cigar, the smoke shapes. I saw a beautiful ring you just blew. 
Well, uh, the, the smoke rings, it's taken a lot of practice. And I have a dear friend called Shari, and amongst our community of friends in London, some people may have met him. He's a consummate cigar smoker, always impeccably presented. He blows the most extraordinary smoke rings of all sizes. And I've never been able to do what he does, but I've managed to eventually get to the point of blowing little smoke rings. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that, Evan? How do you blow uh, a smoke ring? I've never tried. Well, it's, it's, left, it's, but... it's acting, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the movement of the jaw and just putting a little puff, a little sort of pressure from your cheeks and your jaw, and yeah. so it pushes it out like a little bellows. You're creating a, basically yeah. a little bellows with your mouth. And it's very subtle. People think the tongue has something to do with it, but it really doesn't. It's just forming the lips in a ring and being able to apply just the right amount of pressure. So it pushes out a little puff, of, a little cloud of smoke. Um, and as it comes out, it will be formed naturally by your lips. Look, I think I got a small one. <laughs> hey, look, you're, you're a natural, Kirby. It took, <laughs> yeah. me, it took me a few years to get to what yeah. you just did. <laughs> well, I, I had great instruction. You, you passed on your wisdom to me, and I was able <laughs> You guys all saw that, so I've got, it, uh, I've got the proof on the footage. We need, to, we need to see if we caught that. Any thoughts? I know that you sell also pipe tobacco. Um, any thoughts on kind of smoking pipes? Yes, uh, you know, a, a, a pipe is a, uh, again, a wonderful meditative ritual of tobacco and even more than a cigar because the preparation of a pipe, uh, the preparation of your bowl, selecting the tobacco, tamping it in the right way, um, the lighting of the tobacco, um, all is, is very meditative. And I find a pipe works really well when you're, weirdly enough, unlike a cigar, on your own. And if you have some deep thinking to do, mm. you know, the, uh, the cliche might be, you know, writing a book or your memoirs. But, but truly, <laughs> next time you have a, a tough bit of text to, to put onto paper, Kirby, just try it. And Absolutely. it's a truly wonderful sort of pleasure. Yeah, I've actually never... I've, you know, I don't want to say embarrassingly, but I've never actually smoked out of a pipe before. And I hear that, you know, it's actually, you know, it's quite difficult. I mean, not difficult, but I mean, as you said, the preparation, you have to, um, you know, you have to cure or to, you know, somehow seed the tobacco pipe. Is that correct? It, it can be, yes. It depends on the specific pipe. Uh, some come with a non-carbonized bowl. And those are the ones you need to break in and, and cure. Um, but we can show you all of that. So again, next time you come to London, uh, let's make let's put a time in the diary, and and we will sit down. You know, my father's first passion was was a pipe, so I can think of no one better than my father to talk you through uh, the prepar preparation, the filling, and the enjoyment of a pipe. Yeah. Another interesting question from Hashim, uh, which is um, <clears throat> nope, next one up, Liam, which is. You know, do you do you enjoy strong? I mean, you know, I mean, there's light cigars, medium bodied, full bodied. I mean, there's the high, entire spectrum of kind of strength. Um, do you have somewhere on there that you find is kind of your sweet spot of what you really enjoy? And you know, what do you think of some of the stronger cigars like the Maduros, which you know, really, I think just until recently, Cuba really has not produced Maduros. It's more of a Central American uh, kind of product. Yes. Um, you know, very good question, and my general palate for the typical time when I will smoke, and that would normally be after lunch, normally in the shop, um, would be on the lighter side. Mm -hmm. However, um, if I have the opportunity after a good dinner or a very full lunch, and I know I've got a, a clear hour to sit down and enjoy, then I will happily gravitate towards the stronger blends, whether it's Bolivar's, the, some of the Cohibas, uh, the Patagas. You know, very recently I had a, uh, a Royal Corona from Bolivar, which is the Robusta size in a Bolivar blend, arguably one of the strongest blends Cuba produces. And it was extraordinary. It was mm. so well nuanced and didn't knock me off my feet the way you might think a very strong blend would. Um, so, you know, there's always the right time for, for a, a, a strong cigar. The key I would, the only key advice I would give would be to, to match the cigar to the moment you have. 
-hmm. um, and then you will always enjoy it. That's great advice. Now, what about, um, again, kind of whenever it comes to smoking, <clears throat> do you have a preference? And if you're smoking alone, do you do so um, kind of in a quiet atmosphere, or do you do so listening to any music or watching television? Uh, I very, very rarely smoke alone. And um, that's simply because I get so much more pleasure when I have someone else who is enjoying a cigar with me. It doesn't have to be the same cigar. We could be smoking different cigars. But uh, for me, a cigar is all about companionship. And um, I find that, that that pleasure is deprived if I'm on my own. Not to say I don't do it, but I tend to save my smoking for places and opportunities where friends, loved ones, or just other cigar smokers are there. And then I just, yeah. it amplifies my pleasure. Yeah. I think I've um, officially reached the end of this. It has just died out on me. Should I try to relight it, or yeah. is this kind of the end of the road for me? I think you've done very well there, Kirby. I'm, I'm pretty close to that moment as well. Yeah. There you go. You've I've got up with me. <laughs> It's what I call a lip burner. Any further and you will singe your nose hairs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Huh. Well, Eddie, I mean, gosh, thank you so much uh, for sharing this kind of seminal moment with me. Uh, this has been really pleasurable. I think I almost don't want to do anything for the rest of the afternoon, just kind of sit in my chair and let this linger. <laughs> it's, I, I hope it's given you as much pleasure as it's given me because... Uh, the cigar is a, as lovely as the cigar is. It's been 10 times more lovely knowing that you're smoking the same cigar and that we're sharing this moment together. Likewise, uh, I, I, couldn't have th I couldn't possibly uh, think of someone that I would enjoy this moment with any more than you. And it seems only fitting uh, that the first kind of Cuban Davidoff that I've had the pleasure and the privilege of enjoying uh, really was in uh, your good company. And uh, I'm especially thankful to everyone that's joined us uh, through this. It's been, I have to say, one of our longer streams. I mean, a two-hour smoke here. I mean, let's call it pushing an hour and a half, but a good, solid hour and a half smoke, which is uh, my kind of cigar. Thank you very much, Kirby. The, the honor and the pleasure has been mine. And, and thank you to, to all the viewers as well who have taken time from their day to, to share this time with us. Yeah. Well, uh, I couldn't tell you uh, how happy I am to hear that uh, you all are back at the shop, uh, this being kind of your first full week back. And um, I know that these beautiful uh, Davidoff 40th anniversary cigars are available in limited quantities. I'm going to uh, be picking up, I think I'm just going to go for two boxes, why not, uh, of these. I'm going to set them away, let them rest in my humidor. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> you know, wow, uh, of course, anyone that is uh, joining us today. I mean, please, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you have subscribed to this channel as we bring you more great content. Uh, and uh, we've got some exceptional streams uh, scheduled for this week. Uh, please visit Davidoff of London's website. Uh, they've got uh, a limited selection of cigars that you can actually purchase on the site. And um, I think that you ship to most of the European Union, but uh, those American friends of ours uh, I can still purchase and maybe uh, pick them up in person or, or call the shop and see if something can be arranged. Um, and of course, Instagram, Davidoff of London, uh, always a great profile. There's your father right there looking smart. I think that was, um, there's the uh, 40th anniversary. And I think that, is that, that may have been that third one to the right, uh, may actually be the link to the, uh, if I'm corrected, yeah, I'm seeing it to the interview that you did with your father uh, That's actually, right. yeah. uh, for the for 40th anniversary. So uh, anyone that hasn't watched that and has an hour uh, to spare, maybe while smoking a cigar, uh, an absolutely uh, great uh, piece of history that uh, I am glad that you were able to capture. There is the chat that we did with uh, Hinke uh, on the left uh, and his son, Klaas uh, Kellner. Is it Kellner or Kleiner? Uh, Kellner, yeah. Kellners, yes which, of course, um, you know, uh, own uh, probably the largest uh, tobacco farm producing uh, Davidoff tobacco, uh, and, of course, a very kind of storied uh, family with rich history uh, in 
uh, this particular industry. And we had a live stream with class that uh, uh, where he spoke through, uh, spoke through kind of the process of growing the tobacco and making the cigars. Um, and yeah, and you guys are open uh, to the public this coming Monday. That's right. Very excited. I'm sure there'll be a line out the door. Uh, if anyone watching this stream has the privilege of stopping by, you know, please do uh, me the favor. And I guess you won't be shaking hands, but uh, say hello to, uh, to Eddie and uh, Edward for me uh, and send them uh, my personal regards uh, since you're enjoying a privilege that I unfortunately won't be able to enjoy for quite some time, which is their company. Wonderful. So, Kirby, yeah. thank you. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a, a lovely and safe drive home. Uh, and uh, please do send my regards to your father on the way out. And uh, I can't tell you uh, how much I really uh, am grateful for you taking a little bit of time off uh, out of your evening this Tuesday, away from your family to just enjoy this absolutely exceptional experience of smoking this uh, Davidoff number one. Wow. Thank you, Kirby. The honor and pleasure has been all mine. Yeah. Cheers, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Oh, man, well, this is a uh, hard work, I must say. It's a tremendous honor and privilege to really be able to enjoy this cigar, um, you know, uh, and, of course, Eddie's company. Uh, I mean, they are really legends in the cigar industry, and anyone that does have the privilege of being in London or traveling to London uh, and that enjoys cigars, I really uh, would implore you to stop by their shop in the corner of St. James's and German Street. Uh, even if you don't, enjoy smoking cigars. I still think it's a great shop to stop by. You can see they've got some umbrellas in the back. Uh, they've got, um, you know, other great kind of accoutrement uh, for the well-dressed gentleman. Uh, maybe you're looking to pick up a gift uh, for a good friend that does enjoy a cigar. I really can't think of anything more special uh, than a cigar actually purchased uh, from Davidoff of London uh, in London uh, and brought back. And uh, what a great gift that would be. Uh, anyone that is traveling there and coming back, you know, you know what to get me for my birthday now. Um, thank you to all you ha that have joined. We've got an incredible week of streams coming up this week. Um, this is our last week where we'll be doing it every single day. Of course, uh, Eddie Sahakian, commensurate gentleman, uh, and uh, gosh, one of my favorite people uh, really to enjoy uh, their company. Uh, tomorrow, we've got uh, Jonathan uh, Draycott from Bonhams. He is their global head of watches. Uh, and so those that uh, really appreciate and enjoy fine timepieces, uh, this is without question another stream that I'm looking forward to. Uh, Thursday, we have Edward uh, Bodenham from Floris. Uh, they, of course, are just right down the street uh, from Davidoff of London on German Street, uh, another institution in London. Uh, he is, of course, their head perfumer, uh, but also kind of the managing family member uh, that has been really a uh, custodian, a great custodian of Floris uh, over uh, the decades. Uh, they have been, of course, on German Street uh, since probably uh, the beginning. Uh, and then Friday, uh, we'll be ending uh, with Stu Bloom uh, on Ray Fabricare. And uh, he is a good friend of mine and helps take care of my wardrobe. Uh, he is probably uh, one of the most talented uh, dry cleaners uh, really uh, anywhere that I've come across. Uh, and is a wealth of knowledge uh, just in karmic care. I'd say that he's taught me much of what I know uh, in how to take care and look after fine garments. Uh, and then I think next Monday, you know, really we'll cap it in the end. Uh, we'll be just a live stream, you know, with us, um, you know, uh, just with me. And uh, I think it'll be a great moment to kind of reflect back uh, on uh, this kind of really trying and kind of challenging period that we've gone through here uh, with these lockdowns and the coronavirus. I think as we enter in summer, a lot of these restrictions, at least domestically for us all, are being lifted. Uh, we just got back from a nice long weekend uh, in uh, Broken Bow, um, uh, Oklahoma, with the children. Uh, and uh, I certainly look forward to being able to travel a little bit, at least within a slightly tighter radius than we normally would uh, during the summertime. We, of course, are still here. Uh, we've got the new KirbyAllison.com website. Uh, please do kind of poke around. And, um, you know, we're kind of entering uh, the famine of summer, if you will. And so um, we certainly do appreciate all of your business. We've got our beautiful collection of sovereign-grade neckties, uh, one of which, of course, uh, you can always find me wearing uh, on anything that we're filming here at Kirby Allison. If you're looking to pick up a great cigar cutter, uh, our El Casco 
uh, chrome cigar cutters. We've got a few of the gold ones maybe left. I don't, we only order two, so I really can't speak to that. But uh, we've got more of those on the way, so sign up for an out-of-stock notification. Uh, if things are working properly, and please forgive me if they don't, because we're still, of course, working through some of the bugs of the website, uh, you should receive an out-of-stock notification whenever those are back in stock. Uh, we've got our El Casco uh, pencil sharpeners, which I have to say, I never thought I could really enjoy a pencil sharpener as much as I do, uh, but that El Casco cigar cutter uh, really is, um, you know, just as exceptional as their cigar cutter, or their pencil sharpener is just as exceptional as their cigar cutter. Uh, and then we are relaunching uh, our uh, TLB uh, Mallorca GMTO. Uh, this is a selection of just basics, uh, foundational shoes that really every a man should have uh, in their wardrobe. And so if you're looking to really kind of take that plunge into fine footwear, uh, want a little bit of guidance uh, to be able to trust that you're purchasing something uh, that is uh, of quality and craftsmanship, um, you really can't go wrong with any of these models. They're exceptionally made. Look at the really narrow waist on that shoe, beautiful. And so uh, these are kind of a few of my favorite styles that I feel uh, everyone really should have uh, in their uh, wardrobe. Uh, if not these, of course, uh, these same models from someone else, but these are the ones that we thought uh, really represented an exceptional price point uh, to offer to all of you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael Torres, you know, please thank you. Uh, any uh, suggestions you have for the site, you know, please do ping me on Instagram. Uh, I certainly um, really appreciate and value all the help that you guys have provided to me uh, in helping work through some of these technical issues. As I, uh, uh, you know, you really can't, you can't put a value on uh, the thousands of eyeballs of all of you, uh, some of our incredibly discerning uh, customers, and kind of bringing some of these um, oversights to our attention. So thank you for that. Thank you for your patience and kind of working uh, with us as we kind of push through this new site uh, that really is going to serve as the foundation uh, for hopefully what is a very prosperous uh, decade ahead of us. Of course, we're approaching Father's Day. Um, sometime this week, Nathaniel will be coming into the office. We'll be doing our annual uh, father and son shoe shine. Uh, this is a video that I think uh, is probably in its third year, um, if not fourth. I have to check. It's been uh, several years kind of in the making, and this is a tradition that I look forward to every year. And I hope that as Father's Day, um, you know, that spelling error really must be a caching issue because I'm certain that we fixed it, but please screenshot that and send it to me. Um, I think you just need to do a hard refresh there and get that cache updated. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Yeah, sovereign grade face masks. Uh, we've got an incredible collection of gourmet face masks, uh, really cut from some of the finest cloth, uh, beautiful wools, uh, backed in 100% cotton. These are natural, 100% natural uh, uh, kind of face masks. And, um, you know, they're not in 95s, but they certainly do the trick uh, in terms of getting out. We've just added a few styles uh, uh, made slightly smaller uh, for women. Uh, so if your wife or any other loved ones need a mask and uh, you want them to uh, you know, look nice. Um, you know, you can't go wrong with any of these. Uh, and then we are adding some additional face masks sometime this week at, at a slightly lower price point uh, that we've been able to source uh, for those that, um, you know, maybe don't want to spend $45 for the Dorme fabric. It is very expensive fabric. Uh, all those are made uh, from Dorme's current uh, books. Uh, so this is the same fabric that if you were to go to your tailor that they would be ordering from. So if you're looking for a matching jacket, you can do that. Uh, and of course, um, again, our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got uh, all of our live streams archived on the site. This is the stream that we did uh, with uh, the Sahakians uh, kind of celebrating and really debuting uh, their 40th anniversary cigar. Uh, and uh, the Hinkes were, uh, uh, or the uh, Kelleners were able to, to join us for that. Uh, and our entire archive, we look back to getting uh, to our kind of normal schedule here of filming stuff in the studio. Uh, we've got a lot of really exciting things planned uh, that we look to be uh, look forward to be releasing uh, for all of you uh, through the summer months, and uh, we hope everyone uh, stays safe and healthy uh, and in good form. So thank you all for joining me. Uh, I'm Kirby Allison, your host, and you all know that uh, I love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes while exploring the world of quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. Thank you, guys.